Did I say tongues? You said tongues. When did I say tongues? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast, Episode 3. I am Big Z. I am Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And we're excited to have you back on the podcast. Uh, This is kind of midway into figuring this all out. So (laughs) (laughs) we're doing pretty good, I think. Um, So uh, we had a couple good episodes coming into this one. We had our introduction episode and we had our Terex episode. Um, We had a lot of good feedback from the Terex episode. And going into this one, I kind of wanted to follow up on maybe what we've seen, what we've heard. Uh, maybe some of those post-launch tidbits on the Terex. Yeah, I feel like we did a pretty good job of it, considering that neither of us have seen it or had eyes on it or sat in it or, or touched it or touched it or, or sniffed it or, or did drove anything. It, or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, internet for the win. <laughs> yeah. So uh, community re- community response on this vehicle was pretty good. Um, everyone was pretty excited to see Cowie come out. Yeah. Um, especially with a decent offering, right? Yeah. Um, I think everybody was kind of hoping it would be faster, um, even just realizing that it wasn't going to be supercharged or turbocharged, they were still expecting what was given to be faster. I think everyone that's been driving it around has notated that the gearing on it is slower than what they were expecting. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of guys are taking them straight to the rocks. A lot of guys were taking them straight to the trails and going all out on them like they would on their performance machines. Right. And the first thing that they said when they came back was, you know, the gearing on that is super low. Right. Um, so, uh, Around the web, I've seen a lot of guys um, just kind of pushing them to the limits, seeing how durable they are. Um, and the funny thing that I've seen, I've seen more rolled KRXs than I have seen just dirty to KRXs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those pictures, uh, they get hot pretty quick and get spread around, I've noticed. Uh, I've seen, I want to say I've only seen two, though. Yeah, so. I've seen at least seven or eight. Really? Yeah, wow. yeah separate yeah. events. So. I follow, uh, for, for information on the Cowie, I've been following Rugged Radio's page their oh. instagram page their facebook page uh they just got their hands on one and they're blowing it up they got it in pismo um a lot of footage of it in pismo and so far you know i know the guys that are out there uh wheeling it and uh they're loving it yeah, yeah they said it's great i've machine. not heard anything bad about it i haven't it. heard one thing bad about it yeah yet. so um you know something that i didn't realize up front uh and i don't know if they ever even mentioned it in the press release or anything but it, the um the bottom uh, corners where you would normally have your tree kickers and your, your rock sliders um, is beveled in. So it's like at a 45 degree, about 12 inches up where the bottom of the door starts down to the bottom pan, um, which I thought was a really cool feature. It gives you a lot more um, usable clearance. Uh, you don't necessarily always need the clearance in the middle of the vehicle. You a lot of times need it on the side by the wheels and when you're tilted and canted over, when you're going over obstacles and whatnot. Right. right. Um, and then just the fact that They've included uh, a full skid plate, but it's metal. I thought it was UHM, uh, but uh, everyone's kind of giving them crap on that is is <laughs> a bad choice. Weight? Uh, not necessarily weight, just the fact that it gets stuck. Yeah. So when you hit over a rock or, or when you're going over a tree or you know something soft or, or lubed, it's not going to be um, as a big of a deal. But when you're trying to get over rocks and you're hitting those things, they're digging into the pan and creating uh, catch points, almost like holes in your in your undercarriage, and uh, it'll it'll spin you around. It'll stop you from sliding over like you were expecting. So winches are going to be a hot ticket item on the I on think the so. Yeah. I think so. And they've made plenty of room in the front end of that yeah. uh, for a good size winch. So. Yeah, I'm excited about the car. I uh, I really want to see them get aggressive at the shows. You know, I, I would love to see them at the UTV Takeover events, at, have an OE presence to where guys can get out there and drive them. I mean, most of the other OEs are at that show. So, yeah. Yeah. I think they're going to really need to uh, push that part of the game hard to really get full ex- acceptance in the community. Right. You're, you're going to have your diehards that are going to definitely take to it um, and probably have already received theirs by now. Right. Uh, but uh, for the rest of the community, they have to be swayed one way or the other because they've either ridden in a different one, owned a different one, um, or are looking to sell the one they have. So, right. Right. Um, the, the, the reason I mentioned the rollover is it's just because of how big the car actually looks in real life uh, next to people standing next to it. Is it, it really has a really tall and very large presence. And I'm wondering if those rollovers are related in any way to that higher center of gravity. The uh, geometry of the car? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It looks like it has a lot of room for suspension movement. But when you put all the plastic and all the metal up high, 
you're going to always be battling that with issue. I hate to be the guy. I hate to be this guy, but part of it just makes me wonder if part of it's driver error, you know, yeah. maybe guys that haven't been in the industry. I would say long. 95% oh, yeah. of <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> is yeah. either lack of yeah. skill or... Yeah, I mean, you see so much stuff online where a car's on its roof and you come to find out the guy was in two-wheel drive on trails and stuff, probably should have been in four-wheel drive. trying to do donuts in four-wheel drive. Oh, and there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyways, it's a great car uh, from what everything I've seen. My opinion really is still where it was last time. It, it, it still looks like a great feature-rich car. It's not going to be the one that solves everybody's problems, but it's definitely going to be a great platform to build off of. For sure. All right. So going into episode three, our, our theme this episode is to kind of dig into uh, the Model 2020 uh, units that everyone's released this season. I don't think there's going to be any more releases at this point. Um, I think the KRX was pretty much last out of the gate. Well, no, actually, there was the um, Polaris launched their four-seater uh, Pro XP. General? Uh, no, the Razor. Oh, so okay. the yeah, Razor yeah. Pro. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the Razor Pro came out, and everyone was like, well, when are they going to come out with a four-seater? Well, they came out a lot earlier than I thought they would. Right, right. I didn't even hear any rumors. The next thing you see on Instagram is the four-seaters running around. That right. came that escalated quickly. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they were trying to, to jump the gun on on all the rumors and try to take back some of that mind share from the KRX and yeah. other vehicles that have come out. It looks long. Have you uh, done a comparison on the on the length versus uh, the XP? I I haven't done an actual write up yet, and we're going to be putting up a bunch of write ups actually about I, comparison of these vehicles. That's what I'm all about is putting you on the spot. So. <laughs> but I am prepared. I do have. <laughs> Uh, the document here. So let me pull it up real quick. And then they obviously have come out with their same uh, base, premium, and ultimate uh, builds. So let me just pull up the ultimate here for both of us to look at. So what we're seeing here <clears throat> is the same 925cc engine that was on the two-seater Pro. We're looking at the same 64-inch width, 64 uh, 64 width um, same 14.5-inch clearance, same 181 horsepower, uh, really, the only thing you're looking at is a chassis change, right? Uh, the length of the wheelbase. So if we look at the bottom here, you can see that they're at 125 in the four-seater. So if we're looking at the two-seater, we're looking at a 96-inch wheelbase, and you can compare that to like the KRX that just came out with that 99-inch wheelbase, right? But um, so going back to the Pro, the players came out with their Pro XP four-seater uh, with a 125-inch wheelbase. And if we compare that to uh, the four-seat um, Can-Am, which everyone considers its rival. The limo. Has a wheelbase of 135 inches. So we're looking at about a 10-inch uh, less wheelbase than the Maverick. But we're talking about, um, I believe it's an 8-inch or 10-inch increase over the XP Pro or right. the XP Turbo. Right. Um, but other than that, the car is uh, identical to the two-seater. So it's a little bit heavier at 2,044 pounds, which puts it into the league of the Terex, but that's only a two-seater. So um, we're talking about a fairly significant car as far as rolling mass goes. Um, but as far as performance, it's going to be the same as the two-seater with a little bit longer uh, wheelbase to handle those whoops and um, long-stretched obstacles. Yeah, probably the first thing I would do to a car like that is put a little taller tires on it. I think it helped the look, much less the performance. Uh, the car currently, as it sits right there, looks like it skipped leg day. <laughs> That's been the consensus online, yeah. is is everybody saying that uh, the the larger uh, shoulders of this car and everything kind of downplay the tire size and... Uh, everyone thought it was 28s or 27s on this car, and it's not. It's it's actually the 29. So, um, yeah, I think these cars deserve 32s. I don't For think sure. they should have ever put these on there at at that size. They should have came out of the gate with the 31s, uh, just like the just like the Turbo S. For sure. Uh, I think it would have really greatly changed the handling characteristics. So they probably had some decision making going on there. But um, yeah, the uh, the Pro XP4 Seater is now out and available to pre-order with your local dealer. Um, what was the MSRP on that? I, I saw one uh, for the Ultimate, if I remember correctly. It was like 41, and uh, I was hoping that was Canadian. And uh, 41 grand? Yeah. For the Ultimate? Yeah, that's what I heard. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's not, that's... not Canadian. <laughs> Let's take a look at what that would be. So if we go to the builder tool on Polaris' website, which, by the way, I'll mention right off the bat, is better than most manufacturers' websites out that there. That looks fantastic. Um, so you can do a full 3D spin of the vehicle, build it as you want it. So if we just took a base model, um, 
Ultimate Edition without any upgrades. And we go all the way through the process here. Oh, so we're looking at a, a configured total of 32.3 on a OEM spec Ultimate Edition XP4 Pro. So 32, that was kind of in the range of the Turbo S four seater when it came out, right? Right. I think that was 33.5 or something. Right. I got tagged in something that said that it was somewhere in the ballpark of 41, and it must have been just loaded to the gilt, or it was in Canadian currency, like we've been. Saying. Yeah, I think what that might have been is the Ultimate Edition with the Stage, what is it, Stage 5 upgrade audio kit yeah. and all the accessories put on it. Um, I, I just don't foresee Polaris ever putting out a 40 gram machine OEM. Oh, I completely agree. So to get back on track, <clears throat> um, you know, now that now that all the new stuff's been released, I don't foresee anyone sneaking a, a magic feather out of their cap at this point. This is kind of going to be um, what you have for the next season until spring hits, and then somebody might come out with like a ultimate version of something. Like right. A, uh, I think the Turbo S was announced in the spring. Um, no, that was announced in the in the summer, and then the four seater was announced in the spring. So uh, it's pretty rare to get new vehicles at this point. Is the Turbo S like off the pro platform? Is that the rumor or is it? Uh, uh... So, you know, the the rumors going around would be that uh, we're more than likely not going to see the performance upgraded version of the pro until next year's, next season, a 21 release. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, though, if Polaris was trying to change the game a little bit and kind of go all in on this and, and replace their platform. The thing is, is they have a lot of inventory of the XP1000s, of the Turbo S's. Um, they were doing a huge clearance this season on getting those pushed to the dealers and out the door. Um, and I wouldn't surprise me if they continued that through the winter and into the spring to reduce those inventory levels a lot. Yeah, between the RR, uh, the X3RR and the, and the Pro, it, when you go online and you look for deals on 2019s right now, they're giving them away. I mean, you, yeah. can, you can score a deal. You're getting on, them almost at yeah. used prices. And so uh, that's not something that many people have really talked about a lot is the fact that can come out with the RR series. Now, there was a lot of hoopla around it when it first was announced that they fact that they put out 195 horsepower, but no one talked about the actual car and how it compares uh, to everybody else. And, the, and with the Pro coming out at 64 inches, not 72, uh, the RR coming out, you know, on the same platform, same width and, and length and all that stuff with 195 horsepower stock. And they've upgraded the turbos. They've upgraded some of the framing. They've upgraded, uh, I believe they upgraded the steering rack. Um, they've upgraded some of the uh, transmission, things like that. Um, the big thing, though, is that they've increased the airflow through that turbo and the, and the size of that turbo. So um, the upgrade capacity of that machine is even further enhanced by the fact that they they upgraded all those components. Yeah, some of the preliminary dyno numbers I've seen on that car, uh, bone stock was somewhere in the ballpark of about 100 to 145 to the wheels. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah and that's, that's something that a lot of people don't realize is that all these measurements are from the flywheel. Right. And uh, there's going to be power loss going through the CVT uh, to the wheels, right? Um, and generally speaking, uh, you're looking anywhere between 45 to 65% of what your actual stated flywheel horsepower is, depending on your machine and the gearing and all that stuff. So um, the fact that they came out 195, you know, that that performance number is going to be is exponentially bigger going into, you know, the wheels than it is on a, on a lower horsepower machine. All right. So the theme of this episode was to compare the 20 models to each other. And we kind of we kind of settled in down on um, kind of recom providing recommendations to the different groups of people that ride and which vehicles we would pick as the recommendations we would have for them. So, um, you know, we kind of looked through all the different models and, and have been looking at specs. I specifically have been digging deep into a lot of these specs because I'm preparing for um, a new uh, tool to provide to the community um, that I'm developing online. So stay tuned, subscribe for that. I will be announcing that at some point in the near future. Um, but the... I wanted to kind of go through the different segments and talk to trail riders, talk to, um, you know, rock crawlers and, and duners and mutters and, and all those guys, the utility users, and kind of give us um, a recommendation for the 2020 season, which ones they should be considering um, and looking at and, and maybe why. 
So um, just uh, before we jump in, uh, Ian, what what machine are you the most excited to see out on the out on the trails and out on, out and about? Of the RR, yeah, yeah, the new RR for sure. Yeah, that, that seems like it's kind of the um, new kid in town, even though it's not anything new, right? Yeah, it's set up a little different, too. I've noticed the ride height from the factory is set up a lot more aggressively. And, I mean, with that kind of power, you have to you have to do that. <laughs> right. I'd be interested to know if they had changed the springs out, yeah. if, if the springs are rated differently, um, just because of all the torque having to go through those. And um, I don't think they would change the valving, but if they changed the springs, uh, the power loss and squatting would be a lot different. Um, than you would have on the current models because they squat fairly fast. Um, so anyways, getting into it, uh, for trail riders, I think that's primarily the largest single segment in the UTV market is the people that are getting out on the trails, going for rides in the mountains and coming home. So my my recommendation for most trail riders is the XP1000. And I kind of went with that solution because um, it's very proven. It's well um documented that you know they've had issues in the past but they fixed them um, and the xp1000 doesn't have a lot of the heat issues that you would experience in the turbos and when you're trail riding you know comfort's one of those things that you really talk about um, and they have a great uh, seat platform when you're sitting upright and comfortable like a normal car you would be in um, the length and the width are not too extreme now if you're in an area where you have a lot of 50 inch trails i would recommend going down to maybe the thousand s uh, so you get that that um, narrow width and you can get through those gates. But for general purpose, I would say the XP1000 is like the quintessential like default machine I would recommend to anybody out there, right? Without going into, you know, what kind of specialty riding you're going to do once or twice a year. This is going to be an all around good vehicle for you. And riding an XP1000 for the last couple of years, I can speak to the fact that performance wise, you're not missing a whole lot from a turbo when you're on the trails or when you're going through narrow um, cuts through the woods or, right. or anything like that. We ride places where you can't make use of all the power these these machines make. Right. And if you do, you're probably going to end up in a rocketry a hole. Potentially, Something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, the XP1000 has that uh, 999 cc engine putting out 110 horsepower, but that 110 horsepower is being delivered in a very linear, easy to control way. And it seems really natural. It seems more like a vehicle that you'd be driving day to day, work, going to work or whatever. It's very uh, smooth and responsive. And if you keep everything up to par and, and maintenance, you know, up to snuff, you're not going to ever have a problem with that with that vehicle. Right. So quick disclaimer, we broke down six different categories based on what machine we would prefer in those categories. So uh, I make a recommendation based off stuff that I've actually been behind the wheel of. So, you know, I don't want to offend a Honda Talon fan, Kawasaki fan. Right. I just can't make a recommendation on it because I've never driven the car. And I'm going to go uh, a direction that basically nobody would go from a trail riding standpoint. And that's the YXZ 1000. And the YXZ, as you know, I've got about 3,500 miles on that thing. And right. the YXZ might not work great on the East Coast. On the West Coast, it works phenomenal. Um, in the Idaho mountains... I can't think of a vehicle. I mean, I'll wait if you want to come up with another vehicle that'll corner as good, that'll brake as good. Just uh, the fun factor on a YXZ is off the charts. And I actually went with the SS model, the sport shift model. And uh, Yamaha has this contingent of people that are a fan of the sport shift, fan of the manual, and some basically challenge manhood <laughs> if you don't <laughs> choose the manual. So I've got... In the Idaho mountains, I remember one stretch. I was, uh, it was over about a seven to eight mile stretch. I decided to count shifts and I gave up at 170. 170 <laughs> shifts off the sport shift over the course of seven miles. And that's why I choose the sport shift. It's just, it's smooth, you know. Now, now that being said, um, having that interaction and that kind of connection with the machine while you're in the trails and in the mountains, going through the valleys and whatnot. Um, do you think there's any less experience um, or satisfaction with the non-sport shift model? For me, yes. For you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The only way that I could get an equal ride is in a faster car, in a turbo. Like if I were in an X3. An X3, sorry guys, it does not turn like a YXZ, you know? I mean, there's some spots that we go riding where you would probably have to three-point the X3. No big deal. The ride is exhilarating, but uh, the YXZ is just a, an an a different animal unto itself. You know, uh, it's going to ride a little bit rougher in some situations. You know, I know a lot of people say that it's the definitive dune car. 
I'm the opposite. Like I, I love it for the mountains. I absolutely love it. You get the reliability, but the fun factor is absolutely off the charts. And if you like to do kind of almost like rally style driving, that car is a blast. No two ways about it. It's so stable. It's, uh, it's just fun to, it's fun to shift too. Everybody, right. everybody that everybody, I, I very rarely hear negative feedback from YXZ owners, you know? So if we talk about outside of the cockpit, and we're talking about utility in the mountains, right? Um, you know, you're going to be always taking something to eat with you, something to drink with you, maybe a, a sweater, a dry bag, something like that, to where uh, you're prepared for the mountain environment. Um, you now, in the XP1000 that I recommended, it's got a very substantial bed for sure that ha- can have a lot of accessories put into it. Um, the yeah. YXZ doesn't have one, and, and that's why I bring <laughs> it up, right? Yeah. As as far as utility goes in the mountains, and I'm not saying utility work per se, but utility as in usable space, usable design in the mountains when you're there all day having fun. Um, what's the experience when you say you recommend it? You're recommending it on the drive experience purely. 100%. Not on necessarily yeah. the utility. And that's because uh, in the aftermarket, we made a bunch of changes to my car that could, could support that, you know, where I could store some gear, this, that, and the other, you know, while also not affecting the handling characteristics. Right. But, but if you look at my second choice there, like if, if I was predominantly just driving uh, Priest Lake, Idaho, the Washington BDR, my, my next ch- uh, choice would be drastically different than the YXE. It would be a general. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's that's the segue that I right. set up. Right. Uh, <laughs> so the General XP uh, 1000, that's a great, amazing vehicle that people, um, I think, have overlooked a little bit this year. It was announced in a very awkward way by Polaris. It was just kind of like an afterthought. Um, but it has all the upgrades that you would want on a general. And think about the general, how it sits and feels like your riding experience is going to be upright, comfortable. They got big bolstered seats. They got uh, the upgraded suspension. They got the upgraded clearance, the upgraded tires. Um, You got the normal kind of solid, full, complete doors. You have the enclosed cab options. You have the rack options. You have storage, storage, and more storage. Yeah, I think there's like six cup holders in that thing or something. Yeah, Um, It's a great machine, and it's on a reliable, proven platform. Um, and the thing about, you know, the trails is you're going to either be one of two people. You're going to be the guy that's flying around corners and taking it, you know, a hundred miles an hour, not necessarily literally, but you know, just full balls to the walls riding, or you're going to be the guy that's just out cruising, taking in the scenery and enjoying nature. Right. So I ride with a a mixture of guys. I ride with quad guys. I ride with uh, utility side-by-side guys. Very, very rarely do I ride like the Idaho Mountains with another sport machine. And if I don't know where I'm going, I'll be behind those guys. We'll come to a trailhead, and they will stop, and they'll tell me. They'll be like, Ian... The trail's seven miles that way. We don't jump off at all. Just stay on the main trail, and I will literally disappear. Right. And uh, <laughs> by the time I get to the top of the mountain or something like that, it can be, you know, over the course of like seven miles, it can be about a six to eight minute wait, you know. And that right. and that's not that's not putting anyone in danger. The car is just super capable. Right. Yeah. And a lot of that goes to the driver experience as well. Right. Like I want to expect any guy that's that's six months into his machine to ride like that. And, right. And the guys that do are the ones that are upside down. Unless so. they got a background, you know. Right. Yeah. Unless they got the experience going in. For sure. It. Um, but that leads me a little bit into uh, my second choice, which was the Can-Am Maverick Sport. I've never driven it. Every time I get around it, I love it. I yeah. think it is a great, well thought out platform. And the reason I I kind of um, chose that one was because. Outside of the Razor ecosystem, that Can-Am Maverick Sport is very similar. Uh, almost, It's almost like an in-between, um, if you're coming from the Polaris side like I am, it's almost an in-between between a Razor and a General. It's not quite the trucky feel of a General, and right. it's not quite the sporty of an X3 or a Razor. Um, but uh, it has all the room you would need for storage. It has all the cab features if you're wanting to go enclosed. Um, their, their roll cage is actually designed in a T shape so that it can accept doors and and all those accessories into the frame, which I thought was really cool. Um, and it's kind of just a fun looking and aggressive car. Like it's, it's not the same old car. It looks different. It does. Yeah. There's some companies out there building some storage options like Razorback Offroad. Uh, I believe they're based in Southern Idaho. Um, 
so well thought out, like these enclosures that go off the back that you can lock. You can't right. get stuff out of the bed, right. and you can mount stuff to the actual enclosure. It's it's really well thought out. I've I've never driven the car, but I am pretty excited. In fact, I got a friend that uh, he's got a big family, so he's looking at a four seater, and I'm pushing him towards that direction. And I like to think that we stay on top of stuff, rumors, uh, problems. Have you heard anything wrong about? I've that never car? heard anyone not complain a, about not it. a single thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, they've been pretty solid and. Because of the options you have with it, it's a great in and out of town vehicle as well. Right. So uh, I had an honorable mention on my Trail Riders uh, list, and that was the YXZ 1000R SS XTR. So that's really similar to what you were talking about, where it's it's the performance uh, version of the YXZ with the shat with the with the shat with the sh- <laughs> the with the sport shifter in it. And um, the reason I pull this one out of the hat is because it's the XTR that was recently re- announced that has the upgraded tires, has a winch put into it, limited edition colors, things like that. Um, and having that all from the factory, if you're buying this season. Um, is a great option if you're into fun and recovery. <laughs> right, right. So that'll save you the the six to thousand dollars that you would put into a winch or something like that, um, and and maybe tire selection things like that. You know, you you talked about an underrated car, kind of one that kind of goes under. Uh, basically, nobody really talks about too much. Uh, for my honorable mention, I picked another sport machine. I picked the RS1. And uh, I could probably plug the RS1 into a bunch of these different categories as an honorable mention. I think it, I, I think it's an underrated car. I, I would love. You know, um, when you put that on the list, it, it was like, oh yeah, like I yeah. think that it just triggers that light in your head. Yeah. You, you never think about it. Yeah, at UTV Takeover out in Sturgis, there were a couple of them running around, and uh, they were on the rally course, and they perform. They're they're impressive, man. Yeah, I know really a lot of guys impressive. racing those that are just winning race after yeah. race with them. Yeah, yeah, it's such a such a great platform for sure. Um, so let's dive into utility vehicles. So I would say this is probably the second largest, if not largest, overall category um, around the United States or maybe North America is the utility segment, and that's uh, because half of our land occupancy is is farming, right? Right. And so you have a lot of guys farming. You have a lot of guys doing job site work and maintenance with these vehicles. And so it's a whole different segment. And you're talking about, um, you know, uh, load capacity, towing capacity, things like that. Um, and so uh, I don't really want to spend too much time just because I'm not, um, you know, a laborer myself as far as out in the field. And I don't have a lot of experience working day to day with um, a UTV in, in, in the field. But my first choice was the XP 1000 General just because of um, its dual sport nature, being a half sport, half utility vehicle, um, and having the upgrades that come with the XP package. So the upgraded Fox shocks, the upgraded clearance, the upgraded A-arms, all that stuff. Um, you know, when I envision working on a job site or working on a farm, uh, not only do you need to take care of business and get something in the bed of the vehicle and get it there and get it done, but you also need to be able to clear the obstacles. You need to get there quickly. You don't want to sacrifice too much comfort because you still got to work the rest of the day. You don't want your back hurting you, and you don't want you know to have to sacrifice those things. And being able to jump in and out of a, a general like you would a truck um, has a lot of advantages to me. Right, right. Um, my runner-up to that was the Ranger XP 1000, which, again, for the same reasons. Uh, the Ranger has been a proven platform in the utility industry. Um, you can pretty much go to any job site that's a building site or um, some sort of commercial construction site, and you're going to see a Ranger there. You're going to see either a crew or, or a three-seater there. Um, and they're just used day in, day out, banged on, dropped on, hit into things. like they just They seem to be a great platform for that type of environment. And with the XP package, I mean, that just brings, again, that comfort level right. and that uh, performance level back into the, the equation. Um, my my honorable mention here, though, is the recently announced 2020 De- Can-Am Ma- uh, Defender 6x6, because that thing is a beast. So it doesn't have a lot of horsepower. Um, it doesn't have, you know, super high clearance or big tires or anything. But what it does have is a six-foot bed. So what they've took done is they've taken the, the the Defender Max series or the Defender Crew series and uh, replaced the back seats with a bed and a second axle. The thing that blows me away is the payload capacity, 1,700 pounds. Yeah, again, talking about utility, right? Like you can you can load up a whole 
quarter of wood in there. You could put in any kind of tools or, or supplies that you'd want to put into that thing and then still be able to get over the rocks. Right. Like if you're building right. a cabin up in the woods or if you're doing um, a job site where the job site hasn't been um, completely paved over yet or, or it's still pretty raw, this machine's going to be able to take whatever you need to take across site to site and do it quickly without any issues. Yeah, I see it comes in mossy oak too, so they're probably anticipating people well, to take them to up be, in the mountains and go hunting. To, yeah, if you're trying to be stealth, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can't see them. But uh, the other thing is beyond just the payload capacity, the, the towing capacity. Uh, Three thousand pounds, you can pull a trailer load along with the, tr- the load that you have in that six foot bed, and that six foot bed is a dump bed as well. And you can remove the sides and make it a flat bed. Um, the fact that you can do that straight from the factory without replacing the bed is super nice being able to make whatever utility you want out of that bed um, on the fly is, is, is a great option so uh, being able to to hook into the hitch and pull whatever thing that was brought in on the truck across site because the truck can't do it i mean how many times have you seen work trucks getting stuck in mud holes and and things like that just because they More got street tires right <laughs> <laughs> so um I, I i would love to get my hands on one just to go play with it and see what it's capable of um, but from what I've seen um, from the various people that have reviewed it and used it out in the real world, it seems to be a very capable and um, very um, just all around great option. Yeah, so my choices are, um, uh, so first and foremost, my my 1A and kind of 1B are dr- big difference from a performance standpoint. Yeah, I don't think you could get much different. You couldn't get much different. So number one is the Ranger 1000, and it's for all the reasons you just mentioned. Uh, you know, I live out on a farm. I'm around a lot of farmers. I see Rangers constantly. I see them get abused. They put up with it. Um, my 1B, and uh, I'll kind of go into the contrast, my 1B is the Yamaha Viking. The Yamaha Viking you can get from anywhere for ten to thirteen thousand dollars. It is dirt cheap. I have a friend. Uh, I've I've put a lot of miles on the Viking. I have a friend who ran one. I want to say he got about five thousand miles on it, and brutal miles. Just beat the tar out of it right. in northern Idaho. And that car over the course of five thousand miles broke a weld on its muffler. That's it. That, yeah. That, yeah. It just brute strength. I mean, you're going to get a little bit more of an exhilarating ride out of the Ranger, in my opinion, because uh, the, the Viking top speed on that thing's like 51. It's super it, slow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I can't remember. I got to double check, but I think they, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but they may have put uh, the same motor in the Viking moving forward as they did on the Wolverine. But uh, just the Viking is kind of a, in my opinion, almost like a dumbed down machine. It really has trouble finding, uh, it, it, it almost doesn't have enough power to get itself into trouble. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, for some of the riding that we do that I go out on, I mean, the range on that car too is off the charts. Like you can go, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if you can go 160 miles on a tank of fuel in that car. So Yeah. And I've never actually uh, had seat time with one. I've been around a lot of them. And like you said, the experience seems to be easy going. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's more thing, of a golf cart. <laughs> yeah. It, it does have that kind of feel to it. Uh, but the one thing that I can say is that thing is super big. It is. It is. It is super wide. Yep. And, um, and so I would never want to take that thing on a trail um, personally. And the one trail ride that I did go on with one, we towed it back. So, really? Yeah. Um, there was some sort of transmission issue with it. But um, I'm not saying that that's what's happening with all of them. I just Driver with my one error. experience. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. You never know. Um, and uh, But the, the thing that I find interesting is um, when you get that wide, the, uh, the opportunity to do things with the vehicle changes. Like you, you're not stuck with... Um, a, a physical size thing because it's more incapable of doing it. Right. And it's got such a nice wide stance that it can probably pull, you know, an elephant. It's just, it's just so big and so low geared that it can just probably power through anything that right. you throw at it. Right. Right. Yeah. My dark horse was the Havoc X. The main complaint that I have about the Havoc X is driver position. I'm six, four. Uh, I'm not too comfortable in a Havoc X, but I really like the platform. Uh, you know, I've seen some comparisons between it and the general. And I think, uh, you know, it's another one of those cars that we've talked about that is, is a little bit neglected. Right. And uh, you can pick one up. Uh, they're very affordable. And by all accounts, you know, following the information online, they seem to be a very, very reliable platform. From a uh, uh, driving experience, 
I've really only taken a few laps in the car. And like I said, with the exception of being a little bit uncomfortable, I would probably want to switch seats, maybe switch to a uh, aftermarket seat. But right. uh, but outside of that, I was I was actually pretty impressed with the car. Yeah, I've seen a number of uh, reviews on the vehicle, and, and they all speak towards the styling upgrades yeah. and the cabin uh, comfort upgrades that have happened over the last year. Um, not much of them speak to anything that stands out. Like it's yeah. not something that has any kind of... Uh, first place features yeah the performance characteristics are pretty surprising though i've seen guys throw those things over tabletops mm -hmm. you know they're they're a tough car and uh you know it's got a little bit of sport background to it they right. definitely wanted it as a dual purpose yeah so just for a comparison you know we were talking about that um the towing capacity and the and the load capacity and and on the havoc you're talking about 1200 um total uh load capacity and 2000 pulling so it's not quite up there as far as the um, the big dogs, but it's definitely something to consider if you're doing uh, light duty around the farm or whatever, and you just need a more affordable option that has a reliable dealer network. Um, the Arctic Cat uh, network on the East Coast is pretty reliable, um, but uh, I would I would asterisk that with the fact that they haven't been doing super well lately in for sure, <laughs> yeah, uh, in the industry. Uh, but the nice thing about that statement is you can find them cheap. You can find them cheap, you know, and, and part of that, I, I hate to throw it out there, but it, part of it makes me kind of wonder if it's a little bit of a marketing thing. You know, maybe they just haven't really hammered home the niche that that car fills. Uh, you know, when they when it came out, they were promoting it pretty heavily and they promoted it very well. But then all of a sudden they kind of took their foot off the gas. Gotcha. You know, I really haven't seen a heck of a lot of it, but, you know, I was impressed with it. So jumping off a of utility and going into a completely different direction, um, I wrote down my picks for mudders. Um, I didn't write down any for you. Yeah, mudding to me is similar to brain surgery. Like I have no background in it whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, but part of it was I agreed with your picks. If I were going to jump into that segment, I would, I would, I definitely agree with the the direction you went. Right. So, um, you know, my picks, uh, my first place pick was the new 2020 Maverick X3X MR Turbo RR. Now. For a lot of people, that's going to be way out of the mudder's price range. But for the mudder that can't afford it, um, that car is going to be somewhat undefe undefeatable in the mud. Like if you're racing or if you're doing just you know deep mud pits and wanting um, to do those uh, mud hole bounty holes and all that stuff, like the power that that car has will keep you on top of the mud. Yeah, power won't be an issue. <laughs> <laughs> now that being said. I would say that you probably would be doing either portals or you're going to be doing a gear reduction with that car if you're going to be in the mud a lot um, just to kind of handle that torque a little better and put it where it needs to be. Um, but as far as a capable vehicle right out of the gate, um, the, the MR platform being built off the X3 platform um, is so versatile having the having this the snorkel kit and all the ceiling and everything and the mud tires uh and then buying a second spare t set of ti uh, dirt tires that car is still going to perform just like an x3 out on the trails i i know three people that own it yeah none of them have ever seen mud <laughs> you know I, they see sand all the time really Ver sand oh unbelievably versatile car wow yeah yeah um, I'd be surprised to see like a side by side comparison of how the gearing change works on the sand, like how that translates into um, big hill performance and things like that. I don't think there's an issue the guy, <laughs> with that the much main horsepower. Guy that I ride with out on sand, he rips. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So my my second pick um, is more or less a pick because it comes uh, fairly well equipped at a fairly decent price, and that's the Razor XP1000 High Lifter Edition. Um, now, a lot of people in the mud industry will either be on Team High Lifter or Team Never High Lifter. Um, but uh, from what I've seen, again, like you said, I've seen High Lifters everywhere, not just in the mud, including up here in the mountains. Um, and the, the package itself is pretty well equipped for just about everything, and it just comes down to tire selection. Um, the the arched a arms and all that kind of stuff all come into play just like the the mr uh does but um it, it's generally speaking a few thousand dollars cheaper i believe right right so and being the xp 1000 you know you're not <clears throat> talking about a turbo you're not talking about uh crazy torque on your axles things like that so it's a little bit more tame and it's a little bit more uh general purpose and general consumer 
Yeah, I, lo- I like the aftermarket support on that car, and that goes across every platform. The RZR XP, I mean, you'd be hard-pressed to find a company that the aftermarket supports as much as the XP1000. Yeah. yeah, exactly. A- anything that you want to do to that car, it's figured out. Somebody's it's already, already Someone's already it. put it out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Yep. So again, uh, just like Ian, I don't have a ton of experience in the mud, but I've definitely been a part of that community a little bit. And um, those are going to be the two most common vehicles you're going to see next year in the mud for sure. Yeah. So moving on to rock crawlers. And I would also put a little bit of a slash desert uh, into that. Uh, my first pick was the Razor XP Turbo S. When we're talking about rock crawling and, and desert survival <laughs> with your machine, um, there's a lot to think about, a lot more than I would say I would think about in the trail scenario or the mud scenario or, or any of the other ones we've went over so far. The desert has a lot of um, things to think about as far as responsiveness, um, width, and also um, clearance. Something that you don't really care about so much on the trail if you're a, a typical trail rider. Um, it's not something you care as much on um you know, day to day kind of just around the property or whatever. So, um, you know, going into the rock crawlers, it would be really easy to say, you know, whatever the top of line of any company is, that's going to be what you're going to want in the desert. Uh, but I don't think that's true in the case of like Polaris. I think the Turbo S still holds my preference for the rock crawling and desert crowd, um, just simply because of the 72 inch uh, width, the 32 inch tires. Um, it has a little bit more clearance than the XP, the Pro XP. Um, it kind of seems to be figured out already. And whereas the Pro seems to be more of, uh, we have a new platform and we're going to figure out the desert car next season. Um, so that was why I picked the Turbo S for the first place on, on the desert. Uh, for second place, I went with the Maverick X3 uh, RC Turbo RR. And the reason I went with the RR instead of just like the turbo uh, car is because if you're in a Maverick um, X3 and you're talking about desert and rock crawling, um, I've never seen a Maverick owner go slow. Like they just, they're always going fast. (laughs) So, um, you know, the RC edition has the bigger Liberty tires on it. It has uh, some better gearing on the low end. Uh, but being an RR car, you're still able to go fast through the whoops. Um, when you go into high gear, that car is just as capable as an RS, in my opinion. So what are your thoughts? So um, for rock crawlers, my first choice is going to be the X3 RC. Um, the X3 RC, and this is just my opinion, from the factory OE, I feel like it is the best equipped car that you can buy right now. I, I firmly believe that. You're paying for it though. They're right. not. They're not cheap. <laughs> they're you know, not I mean, cheap at all. you're looking at roughly about thirty thousand dollars. And my second choice was the XP one thousand, which is ten thousand dollars less. Right. You know, there's there's right. value there. You can do a lot to that XP for that kind of money. But going back to the RC, I mean, you get a lot. You get you get a skid plate. You get an aluminum roof. You get a winch. I just think it is such a well thought out car. Yeah, I would say that um, the only gripe I have with the Can Ams is. And this is, you know, from what I've experienced driving them, the little bit that I have, and then just every single person that's really put in the hard work on those cars, um, is that the steering rack just needs to be upgraded right out of the gate. Um, especially if you're going big tire, if you're going portals, doing any kind of width enhancement, things like that. Um, you know, the steering rack is where they may have shaved a few dollars, uh, but it's an easy fix. Right. Like people have already figured it out. The product's already there. Right. All you have to do is buy it. Right. And like you, I don't have a lot of experience when it comes to rock crawling. Most of the rock crawling I do is just on technical trails. You know, nothing like uh, boulders that have like a 60 degree angle or something like right. that. Yeah. Right. But uh, my dark horse was the RS1. Again, I, <laughs> when you put that down, I was like, oh yeah. yeah. No, I, I literally came from an event. We'll talk about it here in a little bit. I came from an event over the weekend, which is the uh, crawl in the fall that uh, was put on by Hellbent side by side. And an RS1 one won it yeah i mean wow. he, he went out there i mean granted driver driver plays into it yep it absolutely does i thought the car was really well set up but uh i, I was just, i was so impressed i was really really impressed what that car would do the nice thing about the rs1 um and you know the preface this this is all about a vehicle that you're not bringing anyone with you right, right. so right. if you have that option this is a great solution because uh not only is it lighter and more nimble um 
it's also a lot easier to see your obstacles. It's a lot easier to throw your weight around. That's in a such an underrated feature, yeah. visibility. Visibility is huge. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk about rock crawling, um, you know, having that upright seat position, having that uh, visibility out the door, uh, knowing where your wheel is going to be at, you know, six inches ahead of you, uh, it's a big deal. So, um, I, I love the fact that in an RS one, you can, you can flick it around whatever obstacle you want in a very nimble way. But at the same time, uh, when you approach those obstacles, being able to know exactly where every single tire is would just by looking over your shoulder. Yeah. And after, after visiting that rock crawl and seeing the, uh, the, the amazing amount of broken parts, <laughs> I kind of almost would lean towards an XP 1000 just because it's, unless somebody can prove me wrong, it seems like it would be the cheapest one to fix. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd have some money left over uh, to yeah, fix it, right? Yeah, you would for sure. But yeah. And that's, you know, if you're talking about rock crawlers, you're already talking about knowing out of the gate, you're going to put more money into it than when you bought it. For sure. So, um, you're going to be upgrading axles. You're going to be upgrading some of the suspension components, um, tires, wheels, things like that. So, um, when we talk about the economics of rock crawling, uh, a $10,000 difference is a lot of times fairly, uh, substantial consideration when it yeah. comes to buying. Yeah. And you touched on, uh, the RC coming stock with those Maxxis Liberties. That's what's on my YXZ right now. Yep. And, uh, I'm, I love that tire. I love yep. that tire on that car. You know, and, it's you light. Know, some it, people just say, you know, yeah, I'll change the tires after I get it or whatever. But people don't realize that you're talking about a thousand to two thousand dollars worth of tires and, and wheels. Right. So right. Uh, having that savings into the package before you buy it is a lot of times an underrated feature. Right. Right. I think the only downside that I can think of to the Liberties is if you're going through mud, they can kind of get clumped into the tires and they're pretty little, tight. Yeah, they are tight. But uh, you know, on on the stuff that I ride. I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. And, and and the other thing to, to, to know about those tires is that they're proven in the automotive industry. Right. Like people use those day to day in their trucks and love them. Right. And they're a great proven tire. And the fact that there's an UTV option for them is, you know, just awesome. Right. So let's jump into the fun part of this, the, the more advanced, exciting stuff. So let's talk about dunes. We're quickly joining... I'm uh, just going to bask <laughs> for a second. We're quickly getting into dune season, and if not already fully enveloped in it, and uh, across the West Coast, uh, the duners are out in force. So uh, as far as dune cars go, I don't think there's a better option than getting into a Maverick X3 XRS Turbo RR. I mean... It is a dune built car. Like I can't think of an OEM car better suited for dunes than that car. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, when I started to think about it, I might even lean towards the RC because you get the winch. I mean, yep. there's only a hundred pound difference between those two cars. Uh, yep. Getting the winch is huge. Like my friends get stuck. Period. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and I don't think there's ever been a duner that's not been stuck at right. least once on every trip. Right. Right. And. Uh, that car, especially if you ever slow down, like if you just do driver error, run out of talent, whatever it is, and you get stuck up on a, on a big face, you're going to want to have a way to get down. Um, and the easiest way to do that is just to pull your winch out, hook onto another guy, and just have him yank you out, right? right. Uh, it's not the fact that you're actually using the winch's gearing. It's just the fact that there's a rope already there, and all you have to do is pull it out. Right, right. Um, you know, and it's interesting. We were just talking about tires. I've never really thought about it, but there is not an OEM car that comes with paddle stock. Right. And no sand additions. Right. They might might be coming somewhere down the road, but I think that'd be an interesting concept. Like I don't know if it would just be another thousand dollar upgrade on the on the purchase or whatever. I think it'd be cool if Yamaha did it with a factory turbo. That would be awesome. That'd be killer. Yeah, or if or if Kawasaki came out next year with a, a super sport version of their Terex with with a, that as an option as right. well. Right. So getting into uh our second pick, we've we've got the same pick, but we've don't got the same pick. Right. So, so you picked the XP Turbo S, and I picked the XP Turbo S four seater. Yeah, two seaters for me is the only way that I'll go if I get into a four seater and I'm anywhere riding and I see three seats in my car that are empty. I'm just going to be furious. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, being out in the dunes with a four seater is definitely a different experience than the guys out with the two cars. Like, it, you feel like they've got the advantage. Uh, they're lighter. They're more nimble. Uh, but what I've found is they go a lot slower through the whoops than I do. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the extra, the extra length definitely helps going through the rough yep. stuff. And, and there's a lot of times where carving, uh, at the top of a, of a peak and, and, or just doing ridgeline stuff, um, that extra wheelbase seems to really provide an advantage over a two seat car. 
Um, I'm not sure if I would argue the the X3 Turbo Max would be a better option than a turbo, you know, just a normal turbo um, wheelbase, but just because it's so much longer. Right. And I think you would just end up being high-centered a lot more often. I don't know. I, I know a lot of guys that are in that X3 Max, and they just absolutely rip. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that might just become, that just might come down to the fact that I'm more of a mountain rider than yeah. I am a dune rider. Yeah. And I, I would just fear being stuck all the time. Right. Um, but uh, having been on the dunes with my four seaters, um, you know, that extra wheelbase, in my opinion, was a big feature. Right. Uh, but that being said, um, you know, spending more seat time in a two seater might, might just change my mind as far as you know, there might be more pros than cons. Right. Right. So, um, my, we basically agree. Uh, it would be the turbo, um, it'd be the Maverick turbo and it'd be the art, the turbo S and I've had time in both of them. And there's kind of a little bit of a contrast between the two. Uh, the turbo S that I drove was a dynamics car. It was the first time I'd ever been in a dy- dynamics car and it was running the, uh, the coyotes at 15 pounds. Right. And then I drove, uh, and 15 pounds to me seems like a lot. It's a little bit. Yeah. 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 Um, the cars handled a lot differently. Like I would throw and kudos to Polaris. The last time that I drove the Turbo S, it was on a track that was carved out in Coos Bay by Polaris. And they did an awesome job of giving people kind of a, a really good feel of how that car would handle. And uh, I fought the car a lot. Like I'm used to, I'm used to motocross. You throw a bike into a rut and just, just lay right it in there. Out, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so I, so I kind of would find myself driving this car like that. I would throw it into a rut and it would fight me. You know, it, it would push, it would, uh, it would try to just barrel right through the rut. So I'm just fighting the car. There's some chassis roll and stuff like that. Mind you, the whole time I'm doing this, I'm just grinning ear to ear. I'm loving it. <laughs> like the car, the car was so squirrely, but in like the right way, like I, w- I was loving it. And I had it in the uh, firmest setting, the sport sped it setting. And uh, when we came off the sand, it was way late in the evening. So all that moisture from the ocean had basically bled into the sand. So the sand's super damp. Right. And in that sports setting, I'm just getting my butt kicked. Yeah. Kick it into the soft setting. It is literally got- A different car. It is like going from an F550 truck to a half ton like that. Yeah, You know, I was just like, oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, no, I, I, I was grinning ear to ear the entire time I was in that Turbo S. By comparison- the Maverick X3, and I've driven the X3 on paddles, and I've driven the X3 with uh, the RC with the Liberties on sand. The, they get they develop power differently. Like right. like the Maverick gets momentum going right. and then goes crazy, whereas the XP has a little or the Turbo S has a little bit more grunt. A little uh, right yeah, off the line, yeah, right off the line. Um, in terms of fun factor. The Turbo S, I felt, was a more fun car because you're kind of fighting it. There's more driver input, whereas the Maverick, the Maverick kind of makes things easy. It yeah. really felt like I, I, I mean, I, I didn't feel challenged at all. Like the the loop that Can Am picked when I when I took the RC out, and I've driven my buddy's uh, Maverick out on sand too. But the loop that they picked out, and this was on a 2019 car. Uh, a lot of high high mark type dunes, basically the biggest dunes that Winchester Bay had to offer. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, some of the guys were a little chicken to go up them, so they go up <laughs> only halfway, and I would I would go up all the way to the top, you know. And uh, like I said, I just didn't feel like the car was challenged at all. It right. was just like bring it on. <laughs> well, I think that that speaks to the market, though. For sure, there's definitely a type of person that wants uh, to leave their job at the week on the uh, on a weekend and not have to work too hard, not to think too hard, just experience. Yeah. And the Maverick is really built around that concept, I feel. Yeah. Is that you can get in, do whatever it is you want, and then come back to reality right. you know, Sunday night. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got a I've got a buddy that has uh RS, has a Maverick RS and a YXE. And his comparison between the two on Sandys is going I will show back up to camp in my YXC and I'll be shaking. He's like, I'm shaking because the adrenaline's going so much. Right, right. Then I'll go d- hop into my X3, go down the same exact lines, and absolutely devour them. Yeah. And cut, and probably have shaved off a bunch of time. Yep. And it's just that the car handles that stuff a lot easier. So yep. that, that's why it's my number one. I just feel like uh, I feel like uh, it it can kind of compensate for some of the errors that maybe some drivers from a skill level that they're lacking. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I didn't have an honorable mention here. I mean, naturally, you would think that I would go with like a YXE because I have one. Um, 
YXZs and sand are super fun. There's no question about that. You have to put a lot of thought, especially with a naturally aspirated, naturally aspirated one. You have to put a thought into the gear that you're in before you go up a big face. You have to think about a lot of that stuff. And it all adds to the experience. But the main thing that the YXZ is lacking is suspension. I, right. I have hit G outs. I'm not even exaggerating. I've hit a G out so hard, anywhere between 55 to 65 miles an hour, where I have to pull over and make sure I can still walk. Yep. Like they hit that hard. And uh, going up the face of a dune, you can really just bury that YXZ right into it. And it, yep. it's, a, it's a hard hit, and it'll shave off a ton of speed. Like where I really noticed the YXZ over the last year where I was having problems on sand is we were doing some filming, and we would be like 20 to 30 cars deep. And I'm like halfway back. Right. And uh, the turbo cars are in front of me, and they know that this hit going up this dune is sus- substantial, so they give it a lot of respect. They slow down, they hit it, then they gun it. They right. go up. You can't do that on a YXE. You have to get, you have to generate a lot of momentum, and you go into the face and just get slammed. And if the guy in front of you is slow, you're shaving that dune off, you know, because the, the car will climb any dune, any dune. But you have to hit it at the right speeds, and you can't. You're not really without a turbo. You're not accelerating up it. Yeah. So, and I was gonna say is, you know, as as maybe as a as an honorable mention, I would recommend a uh, YXZ if it had a suspension upgrade and a turbo kit. Um, I've seen those cars out there on the dunes with with the long travel and the upgraded shocks and all that stuff, and and they. They're almost well, unbeatable. <laughs> they're 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 dominating. Yeah. Um, now that being said, I'm I'm referring to more of a side by side performance, you know, comparison where you're racing right. and you're doing things next to other guys. If you're just out trying to have a good time carving dunes, I I still wouldn't recommend that. I would recommend getting an X3. Yeah. Over that. Yeah. You know, horsepower is king. Everybody is really interested in what car that you can line up and go in a straight line super fast. One thing they don't take into account is the more horsepower you run, the bigger the paddle you need. The bigger the paddle you need, the less maneuverability that you have, and that's something that can get out of hand really quickly in Real a fast. YXE. Yeah. And or then, or in the other cars too. You know, it's it's, it's one of those things. I, I think a great sweet spot in sand is about 180 rear wheel horsepower that's a ton but you're still you're not sacrificing maneuverability and to be clear that's like twice what normally people have at the wheels that's 40 more than any stock machine right now yeah so you're either changing your turbo out or uh going with a flash or something i i'm I'm pretty sure there's some programming that can get you up to that kind of wheel horsepower yeah and the other thing about that is you're not only just replacing the paddles uh you're replacing your axles because they're not going to be able to handle the torque and you have a liability in your trans right so um a lot of people will tell you anytime you change tire sizes you need to adjust your clutch as well and me coming from a yxz i don't i can't really speak to that but uh, some (laughs) people that i know know what they're talking about tell me that so yeah the clutch the the spring weight and your and your and your fly weights are going to all have a direct correlation to your tire size right. and the grip. Right. And it's not just that you've gone from a 29 to a 32, it's not just that, you know, you've changed from a road tire to a paddle. It's that your your clutch directly correlates to your grip and if the grip of the tire is changed, you still have to change your clutch. Right. Right. And just as an asterisk as well, um you're hearing a lot of uh, very similar machines as we go by category and category. I, you and I pretty much agree that any one of these machines we're going to have fun in out in sand. Yep. You know, uh, one car that we haven't mentioned is a Wildcat. Yep. Uh, Wildcat, I would have a blast in out on the sand. Uh, they even the 64 inch RZR turbos. Uh, now, when you say you would have a blast on the Wildcat, are you talking about a stock Wildcat or uh, a yeah. cat? With... Yeah, I've driven a cat. I've driven a cat in sand. Yeah, yeah. I, had, I had a great time. Yeah. You know, hmm. it's just all personal preference. It's just one of those things that they, there there isn't really a bad choice. I mean, you're right. going to notice some differences between the cars, but uh, I, I don't think that, you know, th- there's five, six machines that are made right now that I could take the Coos Bay and just love it. Right. I, I think we're at a point in the industry where the machines at that level of purchase, not necessarily every machine they make, but at that level, that 20 plus uh, K range, uh, will provide fun factor for you and your entire family for sure. um, with the understanding that there's going to be some things you can and cannot do. Right. And just for clarification, as it pertains to the Turbo S, as it pertains to the X3, uh, the biggest difference between why I go that direction versus a YXZ, and you know I got a lot of history on the YXZ, is moguls. It's whoops. Like yeah. we, uh, the group that I ride with, uh, we are on the gas. You know, right. we're, 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 we're hauling the mail. And... Uh, the YXZ, 
I don't know if it's old age or what it is, but after about five minutes of di- of whoops, uh, like Coos Bay whoops, and believe me, there's some stretches where you're going three to four miles and it's almost nothing but whoops. Right. My sternum will hurt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like my chest will hurt. Like I'm like, think, am I having a heart attack or something? It is beyond abusive. Right. You know, and it needs that extra travel and you just don't run into those problems with the Turbo S or the X3. And I think that comes down to... It's still two, rough, but... Yeah, yeah and that's, not, that, not that comes bad. down to two things. That comes down to your shock responsiveness and yeah. your wheel travel. On the YXZ, what I just complained about is fixable. Yep. But, you know... I tend to gravitate more towards the X3 and the Turbo S with this stuff. And it, 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 you find yourself, as an owner of a YXE, you're kind of slowly trying to uh, modify the car to do things that the X3 and the Turbo S will already do right from the factory. You right. Know? So. right. Yep, there's definitely an upgrade path when you're yeah. talking about a car like that. So let's jump into something that's a little bit more dear to your heart, the Overland segment. Now, would you say that the Overland segment is kind of blurred with the trail riding experience, or would you say that it's definitely have shaped itself away from the trail riding experience and it's its own thing? There's a lot of similarities, in my opinion. There's a lot of similarities. Trail riding, I mean, and you know, adventure riding and stuff, I, I think trail riders by and large go through a lot gnarlier stuff than an Overlander would. Like an Overlander is probably just as interested in going out and taking pictures as, you right. know, yeah, it, it's, it's essentially adventure riding. It's the same thing that you would do like on a BMW GS 1100 or, or uh, uh, KTM 690 or something like that. It's just about going out and by definition, Overland is essentially uh, vehicle dependent travel. Right. So, yeah, and I think the uh, the needs of of a trail rider and an overlander are are similar, but different in the fact that overland just takes everything that you would want in a trail ride and then and blows it up by fivefold, tenfold. Um, you know, when you're talking about uh, performance um, on the trails, you're wanting performance to go around those corners and and up and down those those grades, but on an overlander, you're talking about needing to do that at highway speed sometimes. Right. And you're talking about having to do that, um, you know, in various conditions versus just premium conditions. Right. Uh, so you're talking about the need for, um, you know, a great, uh, you know, all around tire. You're talking about a need for a great all around suspension that can be adjusted on the fly. Um, you're talking about, um, needing to have the accessory compatibility that you would need for enclosed cabs, heaters, air conditioners, um, uh, storage options, things like that, where you you want all those on the trail rides, but again, it's just amplified for the overland experience. Yeah, and one of the most important co- components is going to be strength. Strength, durability, reliability. Um, there are parts, I, I've done some adventure rides, if you had a breakdown, you were in such a pickle, like you wouldn't, I mean, it's a massive undertaking to pull a recovery off in some of the areas that I've gone, uh, whether it be in uh, like the Cascade Mountains or uh, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, I, I just think that reliability is one of those things that you really have to take into consideration. Yeah. And, and you know, when you're out on the trail, you're talking about keeping a spare belt, maybe a spare tire, t- tire recovery kit, jack, you know, those types of, of items. Whereas on the Overland, you're talking about, you know, a spare axle, spare tie rods, spare everything, really. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you might be hundreds of miles away from something right. versus being, you know, 40 miles into a mountain. Right, right. And, you know, I we haven't gone into our selection yet, but uh, I'll just spoil it right now. My honorable mention was a YXE. And, and, and you could go to my Instagram and you'd know why. Like, right. you'll see my car all over America. Uh, going through mountains, mostly like rugged type trails. And the main reason it's my honorable mention is if when I go out on these adventure rides, if they're two and three days, four days, something of that nature, there's never, ever been a time that I've woke up, got out of the tent or something of that nature and, and had any doubt in that machine. None whatsoever. Like I I knew, I knew that breakdowns just weren't something that was going to happen. Right. It's going to make, the car is going to make it. They're so tough. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, my first pick was the, again, General XP4 1000. Now I say four specifically because um, for storage reasons, you have the ability to take the back seats out, put a storage platform in using the quick, you know, uh, lock seat mechanisms that they have. There's a number of vendors that make storage racks for the back seat on, on those rigs. Um, and then just the fact that it gives you more of a platform for like a over cab tent system. Yeah. 
and um, you have places to put things like water, food, fuel, um, all those things that you wouldn't normally have in a two seater right. uh, without some sort of modification. So when I created a list when we went out, did, did the Washington Backcountry Trail, um, my list was X long. And the th- first thing I did is, okay, now you have your list, shave it in half. Right. And I shaved it in half. And I looked at the list again. I'm like, all right, shaved another 25%. You know, you right. don't want to get stuck with so much gear. But I think the XP4 uh, General is such a great platform because when it comes to uh, adventure riding, especially where we live, you have to think about so many things. It's not just food. It's not just hygiene. It's not just uh you know, water, uh, you have to think about personal protection. You have to think about, uh, fire suppression, uh, making a fire, everything, everything goes into it, you know, camp gear, the whole ball of wax. So, and having, you know, your dry clothes and and your other storage, all, it all takes up space, right? It all takes up, um, capacity. And, and so I've seen some pretty tricked out XP4 1000 generals that, um, would just make life so much easier. Yeah, they check every box. Yeah, they're they're per- they're pretty much the ultimate Jeep in half the package. I think it's the uh, the pinnacle dual sport side by side that we have in the industry. Yeah, the, the general. I think it has a great um, uh, broad appeal as well as just the capability is all there. Yeah. Uh, my second pick was the Razor XP four one thousand for all the same reasons. Absolutely. But with the idea that um, you would be doing it more. The, the pick was more geared towards the guys that are doing more aggressive travel versus the more trail and road oriented travel. Um, That's and, the pick in the desert. Yeah, exactly. Sure. If you're if you're going to be doing more overland in in open desert conditions or uh, just unkept conditions, right? Uh, the the additional travel, the additional shock uh, travel, and the wheel travel. High, higher clearance, things like that all come into play. Right. Uh, I would not put it as my first pick just for the uh, reason that the closed and cab options aren't there that you would have in a general. Um, some of the cabin comforts aren't there that you would have in a general. Um, and that's why my general is number one and the Razor's number two for right. me. Right, right. So my number one was the X3RC, much like a bunch of the other categories. Um, so the adventure riding that I've done in the past... Uh, you know, I, I want to stress that we take things very seriously from a safety standpoint. You know, yeah. we're not out yeah. there, you know, if, if we don't have visibility, we're not all over the gas. We don't want to endanger anybody. And a lot of the trails that we go down, you're going to run into people. You're going to yep. run into full-size trucks. You're going to run into people on quads. So you need to take that very, very seriously. But when there's an opportunity to get after it, we do. And I, I think the XC, X3RC is a great platform for Overland. You know, we were talking about desert. I, I mean... Everybody who does any sort of desert riding knows how capable that car is. Um, I love the fact that it's set up from the factory with a winch. Um, I yeah, I just I feel like it's going to bring a lot to the ride. As well as there's some there's some solutions figured out for storage. I've seen them a ton. Right. You know? So you've got some room to do some uh, do some additions and stuff. And uh, yeah, but, the, the X3 platform for storage isn't any slouch. It, no, it's, it's not. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's the same level as the as the general, but the 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 solutions that like you were saying have come out in the recent years for that platform have been just outstanding. Yeah. And um the the lower the lower height difference on on the Can Am uh brings in some opportunities for some additional height adding accessories with the with the over cab tents and and storage racks and safari racks and all that kind of stuff. Um they're easier to access. They're they're not quite so far off the ground. Um, I mean, we're talking about almost 10 inches compared to some of the other cars. Right, right. Um, and even if you were to do custom cages on the other cars, you're still taller than the X3. Um, so uh, definitely definitely some, some great options in that vehicle. And then, like you said, the fun factor uh, makes the experience that much better. You know, and uh, to kind of backtrack to all these categories, one of the big knocks that people have on the X3 is the riding position, uh, how you yep. the visibility, how you're sitting. First of all, I'm 6'4", so I'm I'm totally comfortable in an X3. And as you can see, I'm sitting right now like the super gangster lane. That, that's how <laughs> that's how it is in the X3 almost naturally. I, yeah. I'm I'm very comfortable in an X3. I've got no yeah. complaints in that regard. But I have gone and then some drop offs out at Winchester Bay where uh, the X3 you you don't see. You just kind of cross your fingers and pin it and hope that the I <laughs> saw someone else survive, so I might as yeah, well might yeah. as well do it. I've yeah. been down this line. It can't be too bad. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, and and then uh, my my second pick was very similar to your first pick, which was the general. You get the yeah. storage. There's just there isn't anything that I mean. The, the general would make for a great trip. 
Yep. No question about it. Yep. I've got the room to put anything in there. Super reliable, very tough. Yeah. Yeah. And and one of the most important things about overlanding is to not forget about the fact that you're there specifically to take in the the surroundings and to yeah. take in the scenery. Yeah. So, um, you know, whatever's going to enhance that experience the most is going to be what you're happiest with. Yeah. Um, and so, and if you have somebody riding with you, I, th- I don't think there's even a debate. You take the general, you know, you right. can haul enough gear for two people. And, yep. uh, yeah. Another thing to take into consideration, if you're considering building an overland vehicle is, uh, operational noise. So when you're driving down the trail or down the road or whatever, um, you know, what you're hearing, it has a lot to do with how comfortable you are. Yeah. Yeah. That's another reason I like the YXC. <laughs> you go down the road. I mean, you can hear that triple screaming, but you're not hearing drivetrain noise. You're not right. hearing, I mean, occasionally I'll hear a little diff noise or something, but right. we've had it checked out. It's no problem. Um, yeah. I, I mean, the YXZ, the YXZ is not a squeaker, right? You know, uh, you know exactly what I'm yep, talking yep, about. Yep. <laughs> suspension any any Polaris yeah. owner will tell you what that is. Yeah. The YXZ, the YXZ by and large is a pretty quiet machine. Uh, I have heard a lot of feedback about the X3 though, that uh, people don't like the intake noise it doesn't right. bother me uh i know an s and b filter will knock some of that right out so right. but uh yeah i mean first world problems right and, yeah. and i think that you know when you when you take into consideration some of the options uh like my second pick being the the xp4 1000 um you know honestly it would be my choice my second choice with the asterisk of i would be putting a new drive shaft in it with a new carrier bearing you know, probably some new tie rod ends and, and radius arms just because of all that noise and vibration. And over time, which is what overlanding is, mm-hmm. is over time, uh, that's going to wear on you mentally, but also physically on the machine. Right, right. And, you know, you don't necessarily notice this in sand, but on trails, on fire roads, you really kind of notice the difference between the RZR, the X3, and specifically the Y. The YXZ, uh, there's kind of a floaty feeling that I feel like when I'm in an RZR or when I'm in an X3. It's it's almost the difference between a rally car and a trophy truck. Right. That's kind of how it feels. Whereas the YXZ is very, very precise, very nimble. It, like like if, if my front end starts pushing, just one let off on the on the gas and then stomp it all over again, you get that weight geometry shifted and the car's just going right through these corners, you know. Right. Whereas the X3 I have a tendency, I don't know if this is how other people drive, but with the X3, I have a tendency to really drift a lot yep. in that car. And yep. it feels like that's what it wants to do, you yep. know? So it, it's got a little floatier, you know, occasionally I'll harass some of my X3 buddies and stuff. I'll say it's like hurting a waterbed. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, when I'm when I'm able to get out on a trail and with, with a group of people really kind of push the limits of the vehicles and, and the terrain, um, I find myself in a, in a Razor being more intentional with the drifting. Mm -hmm. Whereas with an X3, you're more like along for the ride. Like it's deciding that that's what it's going to do because it's, that's the way it's going to handle it. Yeah. And, um, not coming from a a large YXZ background, I can imagine that, um, like you were saying, it's more of a, um, reactional experience. Yeah. And, uh, I would also say that, uh, depending on how well groomed your trails are, are, is going to greatly determine how you're riding those yeah. trails. And so a lot of the trails up here um, in the Northwest, when it becomes uh, thawed out from winter and it's more like springs kind of run its course and you're getting into summer, a lot of these trails have huge drainage ruts. Yeah, And a trail that you went down one week will have a dangerous, super deep cut around the corner that you can't see the next week. Yeah, And, uh, and I can only imagine, and maybe you can speak to this, um, but in the larger cars with the, with the razors and X3s, um, the response to that is typically line my wheels as perpendicular to the, to that rut as possible and just fly over it. Whereas where the, maybe the smaller chassis of the YXZ, do you feel yourself, um, being more like, uh, cautious or more, uh, aggressive to very to aggressive. In yeah. a YXZ, I, I feel like I, there isn't anything that I could tackle that's going to really, you know, obviously the car has the, the ability to bite you if you don't respect it. But right. by and large, I, I feel like the YXZ, it, it's very predictable. Yeah. You know? And it, it takes a few miles to get that going. You know, um, I swapped cars for about an hour with a friend of mine named Ken Dunnigan. He's a short course racer in uh, Southwest Washington, and he has a uh, he has an X3. And we were in the Idaho mountains, and I made a mistake in his car. I was going towards a ravine that was blind; you couldn't see it, and. It, 
in the older X3 is one of the complaints people said they, they, they don't break particularly well. And, uh, I was going towards this ravine. The car is not stopping. And, uh, I literally just as a last ditch effort, crank the wheel to the right, pin it, car just literally hooks and yeah. goes right around that corner. I'm like, okay, I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that was one of the first times I'd ever been in an X3, but yeah, it's, it's almost like a torque steer type thing. It was, uh, it, it shocked me, but yeah, yeah, I think, I think, uh, with the higher horsepower, bigger cars, um, you know, going too fast in a straight line sometimes is the, the end of you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you have to, you have to use that, um, the steering capacity and that drifting capacity to its fullest to survive some of the things that you find yourself throwing your throwing into. Yeah. What's been your experience as a passenger in, in some of these cars? Cause I'll give you an analogy. <laughs> so, uh, um, I'll, I'll tell you what my butt pack pucker factor sure, goes sure. up a thousand percent. Yeah. So I don't like being a passenger <laughs> at, at all. And, uh, so one of my coworkers was riding, uh, this was in the Idaho mountains and he was riding with Ken and, and, and he kind of got that sensation of the floaty feeling of the X3 and it feels, right. it feels unstable in yep. the hands of a guy that knows how to manipulate it. It's not unstable at all. Right. Very, very good car. And when he hopped into the car with me, he's going, no, I don't think I'd, I'd ever buy a side by side. You know, I'm not really into it. Uh, we go for a ride. We're 10 miles in. And he's been in my YXZ for about five minutes, or I'm sorry, about 15 minutes somewhere in that ballpark. And he's going, I want one of these. This, yeah. And it's it's all based on his experience as a passenger. But right. obviously, he felt like the YXZ was much, much more stable. And I had to tell him, like, it's just totally different when you're driving these things. You know, the the pucker factor goes way down. You yep. know, And in yep. some instances, you just got to trust your driver. I know that's kind of hard for people. <laughs> very hard for me. But <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've extended the floorboards a little further than oh, factory. Oh, no question about it. <laughs> yeah. a no, I, I, when I almost went off that ravine, I, I thought I was pretty close. I mean, I can squat quite a a bit man i was like am i gonna break this brake pedal <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah i was pushing pretty hard but all right so so as far as overlanding goes um you know we've we've mentioned our picks but the thing about overland uh and especially from anybody that's coming out of the um normal vehicle world jeeps trucks whatever and you're making the transition into utvs um they'll know especially well that overlanding is all about personalization mm-hmm. like it's no one does anything the same. Everyone has their unique little twist. Everybody has their own needs and wants. Um, and and our picks aren't going to be everybody else's picks. As it pertains to overlanding, I've never been involved in a market segment that that kind of pokes at the inner gear junkie that we yeah. all have in us. Yep. And it's and it's everything from camp gear to clothing. And as soon as you start to incorporate your side by side in that, and you start to, I mean, you're going to probably be calling custom um, uh, fabricators and stuff for certain right. features that you want to add to your car. But Overland is, Overland's a m- huge. It's amazing. Like you go to Overland Expo West, they're, pre- they're predicting something like 30,000 people will show up this coming year, which is yeah, just it's growing, it's growing substan- substantially. Yeah. yeah. And, and it comes down to, you know, the big, the big car that people see in Overland is a lot of Toyota stuff, a lot of Jeep stuff. Yep. And why side-by-sides, in my opinion, are, are going to start to take over, maybe not take over, I don't use that term loosely, but why you would see more of it is because guys want to go 50 to 60 as mm-hmm. opposed to 15 to 25 on some of these more technical right. trails. And the side-by-side can just obliterate these trails. Yeah, and, and yeah. you said before that, you know, going down the, tr- down the trail in your, your vehicle, um, your, your truck vehicle, mm-hmm. that you're, you're more concerned about the vehicle surviving some yeah. of the stuff, whereas yep. in the UTV overlanding experience is more about how fast can I get to the next spot? What can I see at this point? Oh, I want to change directions and go up that mountain, yeah. you know, where you wouldn't be able to have that freedom in, in a larger vehicle. And part of it is just being comfortable. Like you could, you could look down at the speedometer, see that you're doing 40, 45 and you don't feel out of control whatsoever. I mean, there's none of that in, right. a, in, in my, like my FJ. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah. I think a lot of that has to do with just the connection to the machine as well. No question about where the it. UTV, you're so, there's so few components between you and the tires. Like there's not a lot there. And if you're in a big FJ, if you're in a big Land Cruiser, if you're in a, in a you know adventure van or something like that, there are so many electrical components and so many computers and so many different pieces of equipment between you and the road that there's a there's a disconnect. No matter how well they engineer and how how well they program it, it's all digital. It's not analog. Right. And with a UTV, you know, while it's still drive by wire on the brakes and gas, it's still you're touching the ground through your steering wheel. No question about it. Yeah. Yeah. No and I think the experience it. is is just that much more amplified by going that route. And that's to be honest with you, that's why I love that YXE. 
is I, I've never been in a car that you have that sensation so much is just being kind of in tune with what's going on. And like I said, if I bought the YXE, 100% honesty, I bought the YXE because of what people said it wouldn't do. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get it. Watch. And right. there isn't anything I've ever, uh, there's literally one hill, one hill I've ever had back down on that YXE. I had a coworker with me. He and I are a couple big guys and that's probably why we didn't make it up. <laughs> it, it was down by Deadwood, South Dakota and I had to back down it. And I felt validated that it was a legit hill because as soon as he got out, cause it was like two in the morning, as soon as he got out to guide me down that hill, he couldn't stand on the hill. He right. kept falling down and stuff. <laughs> it was, it was very gnarly. Like we were on two wheels a couple of times, but that is literally the only time in the YXE I've ever had to turn around. It is, it is a very underrated car. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the the technology and, and the development of the accessory market, um, sp- specifically for towards uh, the engine and the suspension on the YXZ, uh, has made that car a completely different car than OEM. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, and so that brings us to our personal build preferences. Um, this is, I was going to make this kind of our... Um, you know what's our ultimate machine pick, but it's it. I kind of wanted to be what would our ultimate pick be plus the changes. Um, and so uh, for my pick, I went with the the Razer Pro XP. Uh, probably would go with the Pro XP four, uh, just because I come from that longer chassis um, world, and I prefer that. Uh, also, I have a family, <laughs> right? So right. Uh, some of my some of my decisions are skewed because of that. Um, but I wouldn't take a stock Pro XP. I would take the Pro and 64 inches, I think, for the majority of what I would want to do. Um, that platform would benefit greatly from being 72 to 78, um, um, 74, 72 to 74. Um, but taking and putting on a reflex suspension plus eight suspension kit or a shock relocation kit, uh, putting you at that 72 inches is going to be what we're all waiting for, right? That Pro XP turbo s version um and then what that also does is it brings the shock towers out further to the outside of the body of the vehicle being more um uh, more nimble that way eliminates a lot more body roll uh you're not at such a steep angle on the suspension that that it just wants to roll on you you're pretty much going to be setting it up specifically for terrain that you already ride on like uh idaho mountains stuff yeah so so i prefer mountain riding um now everybody in the comments is going to say, well, you're not going to be able to go through any of the gates. You're going to be stuck to certain trails or whatever. Um, I have yet for that to be a problem. I've, I've ridden with some 72 inch machines that have had obstacles that they weren't able to, um, let's just say legally avoid. Um, but the experience was never negated. Like, nothing changed in in our experience. It was just, okay, well that's one hurdle hurdle that we're going to avoid and go a different route. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would love to get into a more wide platform that gives me more, um, stability in the high performance situations I find myself in. So I'm, I'm constantly trying to, uh, find the next limit of my driving ability and, uh, experience things faster, more aggressively. Um, and so a wider platform for me would be, um, and again, I, I specifically call out the reflex kit just because of the shock relocation. You're moving your shocks out four inches both ways. And and that changes the handling characteristics a lot and reduces body roll a lot. Um, and with the Pro, they moved the shock towers in from the previous XP platform. So the XP platform before, um, I want to say it was around 14 inches wide at the shock tower uh, mounting points. And on the Pro, they narrowed it down to more like the X3, um, which a lot of people don't talk about. I covered it in my write-up, but um, it's it's somewhere in the neighborhood, um, if I remember right, like 8, eight to 10 inches or something like that. Yeah. So having, the, having a, a kit to bring the shock towers further out, in my opinion, for what I do, um, would greatly increase the handling characteristics of the vehicle. Now, that being said, Polaris may have something in the works that's different uh, for next year. But, uh, with what we have now, I would want to do that. Now, that being said, that's just a relocation kit. That's not your long travel arm. So if you're doing that on stock a arms and stock trailing arms, um, you know, you're going to feel a little bit more stiff because you're getting more vertical than you are, uh, angled. Um, and so I would also include an HCR long travel kit with that as well. They're lightweight, they move fast, you're reducing your momentum, uh, mass, um, and so the nimbleness of the machine would, with the increased width plus the lightness of the gear, 
but also the ruggedness of that gear are really going to provide spades of improvement on the vehicle. Yeah. Um, I would probably go to a four or six inch portal personally um, to get the, the additional clearance without a lift kit. Um, again, because I'd be going with the relocation kit, I'm not going to be doing a bracket lift or, or anything like that, like extreme preload or, or whatever. So having the additional clearance, um, in my opinion, to get over obstacles would be great. Um, a lot of guys don't like portals because they say they fail too much, but um, I think that's more about maintenance, and I think that's more about preparedness, uh, making sure everything's tight, everything's lubed well, no leaks, things like that. Um, also, the Gen 3s uh, on the portals are, are fantastic. So. so, And then I would probably follow that up with some larger tires. Um, a lot of guys would probably want to say 32s. Uh, just because I like doing things different and a little bit oddball here in the Northwest, I would probably go with 34s or 35s and I would probably go with maybe a, a warrior tire from super area TV or, um, maybe a tensor tire, uh, like the, the DS, but, um, a larger tire on portals. And I would probably get up in the neighborhood of almost 20 inches of clearance and that alone, when you're out in the thick of stuff is, you know, hands down, one of the biggest benefits you can have. I've gone through big brush fields. I've gone through things where it's like, you can't see where you're going over. You can't see uh, the rock ahead of you. You can't see the hole ahead of you. I've bottomed out into badger holes. I've gone into like just random boulders that you can't see. Um, and having that clearance and that bump factor would be huge. Now, that being said, this is kind of a ridiculous build. And I would more than likely stick with a 32 inch tire if it was just me purchasing something um, and go without the portals and just go with a, a good solid 32 inch tire. Um, but if I were money, no object, that's what I would do. Yeah. Yeah. So my personal choice, big, big shock was the, uh, <laughs> All right, hold on, let me guess. Yeah. <laughs> a Terex. Close. Oh. Yeah. Uh, an X3 RC, uh, and I'm not picky. I would take the 2019. I would take the 2020 RR, either one of them. Um, one of the first modifications that I would made, make is the same modification I would make to any machine, and that is a roll cage and a set of harnesses. Yep. Um, roll cage, if you're – honestly, I'll, I'll just say it. it. You should change your roll cage period. They're not safe. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I see constant arguments online about the stability, the, uh, the strength of stock roll cages, you know, and that people more or less selling it that you can get away with it for a little while because the OE cage is pretty good. Right. Don't go by that principle. Change. Yeah. Just for clarity, those ROPSs, those yes. rollover protection systems yeah. are literally... That's a roof. That's not a roll cage. <laughs> well, yeah. it's it's governed by the by our U.S. government to be compatible with a thirty-five mile an hour tip over. Right. Not a thirty-five mile an hour rollover. Not a sixty mile an hour rollover. Not a two mile an hour rollover. We're trying to go over over a big rock. It's rated for a thirty-five mile an hour tip over, which means low momentum, low velocity. The fact that you you turned one way too hard and you tipped it over. Right. Right. They're not rated for anything more than that. Right, right. And so if you survive a rollover in one of those cages, you are very lucky. You should buy a lottery ticket because they're not they're not rated for that. No. Now, that being said, geometry and, and all those A, B, C pillar angles come into play and can greatly support a, a safe situation. We're not saying a vehicle is not safe, but it's not safe when you take it out of the intended riding experience. Right. And so I've yet to meet... Anybody that puts that much money into a vehicle and not take it, it out of that out experience. Cage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So no. the, the, the cage is definitely uh, on top of the list. Um, if I were talking about just, you know, requirements, it would have been on the first thing on my list. For sure. Uh, and the thing is, people just don't like the price tag associated right. with them. Right. But uh, when All you're right. spending that much money, you better be prepared to add, add the other $2,000 for that cage. Right, right. It can It can have grave, grave consequences. Um, so roll cage and harnesses, uh, fortunately for us in this industry, there's a bajillion different companies out there that, uh, that build very, Every state very has their own manufacturer. Yeah, yep. Very quality roll cages, uh, harnesses are personal preference. You, you want to put on there what's comfortable. Um, I would, I would highly suggest if you are considering putting harnesses in your vehicle to either go to a trade show, go to a dealer that has them in stock on a seat for you to sit down, try on, 
or get in a vehicle that has them and and see what fits you because I being a tall torsoed person I I cannot sit in some of the harness manufacturers products out there. Yep. Yep. I'm glad you touched on that cuz like uh on my YXZ I've had three sets of harnesses. The first set I was horribly uncomfortable. I I didn't like them whatsoever and then I uh I made a switch to um uh, I'm I won't even go into the brands or anything. Right. It's not like I'm honking, but uh, the last two that I put on there uh, was very, very comfortable, very, very yep. uh, secured. Um, the The second set that I put on, I actually purchased because I didn't like the first set so much, and then the third set was a sponsorship deal, and right. uh, those those were those are those are fantastic as well. Um, and and just so that people know, because a lot of people don't understand a lot of this, there are different types of harnesses too. There's different widths. There's different multi. Uh, contact points right there's different clasp styles there's buckles and and latches and all different types of styles but there's also uh uh seat belt style ones where they where they will let out and then click in if you hit any right. kind of turbulence so uh there's all different types of options for all the different riders out there and and you definitely need to go out try them on see which one's going to fit you because if you just pick whatever brand someone's raving about on instagram like you're not necessarily going to be happy. And right. if you're not happy in the ride, you're not going to wear it. And if right. you're not going to wear it, you're not going to be safe. Right. Yeah. And, and there's kind of a, uh, some misinformation about how you actually put those things in too. So like you take it like a 4.5 point, you want that around your waist secure. You want that on your waist. You want it pulled back into the seat. If there's any slack whatsoever, you actually want it up top. You don't want it. I mean, you want that security around your waist. That's yep. first and foremost. Yep. So, and just to put a caveat on this as well, just to add to your point, just installing your harness to the seat support bar on your four-seater Razor or whatever the vehicle you're riding is, is not safe. Right. For one, the bar is not thick enough to support the impact. And two, it's not at the right height. Your, your, your harness bar should be at shoulder level. Right. And if it's not, it should be in a way that the seat compensates for it or the harness is made to... Uh, compensate for that through its sizing or whatever. So right. um, installation is not as uh, straightforward as just bolting it in. There's some things to consider and to do it correctly. And a good reputable manufacturer will have all that information in their installation instructions and on their website. So take the time, get the right product, get the one that fits that you're willing to put on every time you're riding and, right. and stay safe. Yeah, And, you know, I put roll cage and harness down as my number one modification. I think we're on the same page. Yep. That, that is that is a number one across the board, but I put it on there because we need to talk about it. Yep. So, um, so with that exception, uh, my next modification is communications. If you've never had radios and then you jump into a car that does have radios, like a car to car, or, uh, you know, just like a 25 watt or 60 watt rugged radio setup, something of that nature. It is, uh, it completely changes the dynamic of your ride. Yep. No question about it. I mean, it, it, your ride just adds a totally different component. And for the, t and that, that, that applies anywhere that applies in the mountains that applies in sand where I get into it. It's in the overland rides. We couldn't do it. You right. couldn't do it without, without communications. There's so many turns and it's so dusty out there that you keep about a mile distance apart so that yep. the dust stays down. And there's no way to stay on the same trail unless you have communication with each other. Yep. And uh, and that goes for riding groups of two all the way out to 15. You need to be able to communicate. And uh, I think that is such an underrated add-on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you think about driving your car from wherever you live to some far distant place that you want to go on vacation or something, like can you imagine doing that entire trip in silence? Right. You can't. Right, right. And uh, once you open up that door to communication, it the whole world opens up to, uh, you know, comfort because you're asking to make sure everyone's okay. You know, if there's an issue, you can stop. You don't right. have to suffer through something like a potty break. Right. Um, you know, with a family, I'm talking specifically, like that's my experience, right? So the more communication you can have, the safer you're going to be, the right. more comfortable you're going to be, and the overall experience is going to be enhanced. Right, right. Not to mention you can listen to music. Yeah, and we try not to brand honk too much, but I don't have a pr problem brand honk on rugged radios i've had a relationship with them since the day that i started in this industry and and the 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 components that they build are so well thought out I, it's hard to go wrong I, it's hard to go wrong you know i don't want to do too much brand hawking i mentioned the harnesses earlier as i opened my shirt <laughs> i was to, gonna uh, say superman style to, here to reveal my uh, g-force off-road shirt here <laughs> so yeah so in in terms of the the third upgrade um uh, 
the car that I want next is going to be an, a Dune Slayer. I want it to just be out of hand fun and yeah. sand. And so it's going to be a turbo upgrade. Yeah. And there's a couple of companies out there that do turbo upgrades for the X3 that are phenomenal. You have Boondocker and you have Evo. So yep. those are kind of, in my the opinion, two yeah. it seems like the pinnacle. Yeah, no question about it. There's uh, high horsepower capable kits out there. And to be honest with you, they don't really break the bank. They don't break the bank so much that when you look at the new car, 195 horsepower, and you're coming in at just shy of $28,000, they're giving away 19s nowadays. And the yeah. 19s, you can literally pick up for somewhere between 20 to 22 grand. Those turbo upgrades will still put you under the new RR and you've got more power. You know, obviously fast forward a few months, Evo, Boondocker, places like that are going to take that RR to the next level. Right. But and they're already it, doing that. And yeah. they're already doing that. Yeah. Uh, but as it sits right now, you know, there's, there's a, there's turbo kits out there that are just holy cow amount of power that you can get out of that X3. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's, that's my choice. The uh, XRC, X3RC. Tell you what, I would love to sit in that thing when it's built. <laughs> um, and so uh, we talked a little bit about safety and, and the need for a proper roll cage and, and harnesses. And coming from a manufacturer of helmets and, and goggles and such, um, I, I want to take an opportunity to remind everybody that it's super important to protect the thing that controls everything, and that's your brain. Yeah. Um, and so if you're doing any kind of riding uh, where you're going more than a few miles an hour, a.k.a. every ride, um, if you have the opportunity to wear a helmet, I would highly suggest it. Getting a proper DOT, you know, certified helmet, um, uh, being being partial to uh, some of the the local brands here, you know, getting into a climb or a five oh nine or you know something like that. Uh, helmet is fairly affordable, especially for the whole family nowadays. Um, and looks and styles all match cars and outfits and all that stuff, so you don't have to look like a goof with a helmet on anymore. Um, but the, the reason I bring it up is, is because the other day I saw somebody post a video uh, of them on a trail ride that was fairly chillaxed. It was laid back, you know, 530 club style ride. And uh, their GoPro caught, you know, someone coming around a corner too fast and going flying off the cliff and rolling hundreds and hundreds of feet down the cliff and not surviving. Yeah. And so... Uh, you know, that there's a lot of things that go into that. There's not just a helmet. The helmet's not going to fix bad judgment, but, um, the loss of life is never worth the loss of money out of your out of your wallet. Right. Right. And, uh, I'll be the first one to admit that I am horribly inconsistent with this. You know, there's certain groups that I go ride with that, um, uh, their cars are substantially more underpowered than mine. And yep. so we don't get too crazy. You know, yep. we're not driving too, and it, that doesn't excuse it. That doesn't mean that it's not a worthwhile investment. I can tell you the last few rides that I've done, uh, specifically out in South Dakota, um, I actually purchased a full face, uh, G-Force off-road helmet yep. and, uh, visor, you know, when you're talking about cruising down a mountain trail or a dirt road or something of that nature at a pretty good rate of speed, that visor is so handy. Cause I, I, I especially, <laughs> especially during is. the summertime, I run without a windshield and, uh, that visor basically compensates for that. So it's a very comfortable helmet, very safe helmet. And, uh, you know, the full face coming from motocross, I always kind of thought hey, it just had a weird look to Discounted me. Discounted it. Yeah. 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 Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm all in there. They, they, you know, my helmet's ridiculously uh, comfortable. Yeah. I've, I've typically always worn open face goggle helmet setups. Yeah. Um, and I, I even still, do that for snowmobiles. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And, I would say that nine times out of 10, I do prefer that setup. Um, it's a little bit more breathable, a little bit cooler, um, a little bit more comfortable in yeah. my opinion. Um, but as a person that wears glasses and wanting to take the opportunity to keep that visual clarity, um, wearing glasses isn't always the most comfortable with goggles. No, not at all. Um, but what I've also noticed wearing full face helmets when riding uh, side-by-sides is a lot of times... I don't want to stay a mile back behind someone, right? And so you're constantly getting bombarded by dirt, rocks, things like that. And with an open face helmet, you can get that all inside your helmet, right? right. All that dirt goes inside. Uh, rocks can hit your cheeks, your nose, or whatever. Right. Um, and, and my helmet has a skirt and three different lenses. So based on the right. situation, what time of day you're riding, it's literally a five-minute adjustment. You can put a different lens on it. Yep. So you don't even need to run sunglasses. And some of the helmets have flip-down sunshades and, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, comms get easy, gets easier with a full yep. face. Yep. Um, <clears throat> the overall experience can be greatly enhanced by a full face helmet. Um 
But oddly enough, one of the things I most enjoyed about wearing a full face helmet was just the fact that my face stayed clean. Like you get, you get on the trail, even if you're a mile back, it's still dusty and you're still getting that fine particulate in your face and being able to take your face off and not have to go find a wet wipe just to, to feel right. normal. And you're not breathing that in and you're not for breathing the most, for the most part. Yeah. Your nose isn't getting all clogged right. up and, um, you know, all that stuff. So there's a lot of benefits to wearing a helmet in general. Well, that goes back to what you were saying about this being the ideal time to ride because the dust is way exactly. down. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, getting out of that into kind of the season that we're in, right? We have uh, this time of year, uh, a migration of people that take their their time off of work and and travel to the dunes. And uh, the reasons for that are many. Um, Cooler temperatures, but also um, escaping the rain and the snow and the sleet and all that stuff. But um, also just the fact that uh, on the dunes, one of the worst things to happen is just too, just way too much wind. Uh, it, it blurs out the sand, blurs out the edges of things, takes the, the lips off of stuff. You can't see it. Uh, and that becomes very dangerous. And so you can't go as fast. You can't go as big. You can't have as much fun. Right. Um, and you're typically going home with something broken. Right. Uh, and so this time of year, um, just the weather patterns change. I don't know what the magic is, but it happens this time of year where a typical experience at a dune, if it's a sunny day is going to be better than any other sunny day during the year. Right. Um, so that being said and safety being said. Be safe out there. Be responsible. Don't go too big. Be ride within your limits. Know your talent level. Don't run out of it. Um, and uh, and have fun out there. Now, that being said, the trails, like you, we were just talking about the dust, right? This is one of my favorite times of year to ride. Like, no question about it. It's like, not too hot, not too cold. It's kind of perfect, right? Yeah. You, can, you can start down at the base uh, with a t-shirt and jeans and you can get halfway up the mountain, pull your sweater out of the dry bag, put that on. If it gets rainy or whatever, you know, you can, it usually lasts only for 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. And then eventually you hit snow and then you have that and then you have rock crawling through, you know, the various terrain. It's just a, there's no dust. Yeah. Like you can, you can travel as a pack instead of as a, a train a mile apart. Yeah. And ask anybody about the Pacific Northwest in the fall. It's, it's, it's got awful to look at. Like I wouldn't recommend <laughs> Don't it. come here. Don't stay come away. Here at all. Leave it yeah. for us. Idaho is worthless. Don't, <laughs> don't ride there. <laughs> so, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, there's nothing cool about Montana. <laughs> yeah. The, the scenic beauty of the, the Northwest is, is unique in that no matter what season it in, it, it's in, it's beautiful unless it's fire season. Right. And usually this time of year, we're cleaning up fire season and we're out of it. Luckily, we've had a great year this year. Right. We haven't had too much smoke, but like last year, all summer was useless until you got till October and then it was all cleared up and you could go see the mountains. You could see the color changing in the trees. You could see, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah, you have to plan rides around fire yep. in, in the Northwest. For sure. Nuts. So... Uh, super excited to get out a couple more times with some friends and, uh, before the snow hits too heavy, uh, to where you're only riding tracks, but even that's fun. Right. So, uh, so, uh, events, uh, we, we talked last episode about some stuff come up that was upcoming. Um, I know that you, uh, got to go to a certain event this year, uh, this week. Yeah, I got to the uh, got to go to the Hellbent Crawl, which was in uh, Goldendale, Washington and Southern Washington. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, basically I'm trying to visualize where Goldendale is. I think it's just north. Well, it's pretty close to the Columbia Gorge. I can't remember if it's closer to the Dalles or to Hood River. But uh, yeah, it's, that was a, that was an eye opener. You know, like I said earlier in the show, I don't have a lot of eyes on. I don't have a lot of experience with rock crawling and uh, the, the way that they had it laid out was awesome. Just seeing some of those machines, seeing obstacles, they're like, there's absolutely no way that a machine will go over this. And not only did it go over it, all of them went over, it, right. <laughs> you know, in some way, shape, yeah, or form. Yeah, the event was put on. It was put on fantastic, and there was a, there was a ton of action. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it was it was it definitely worth checking out. You know, so was that a timed event or was it an ob- obstacle scoring? Event? All the above. Yeah, all the above. Yep, timed event. Uh, points. Yeah, obviously points uh, added for um, or deducted uh, for backing up, for hitting a cone, anything and everything. So you have a spotter that runs the course, calling out obstacles, calling out lines, and uh, then you had the the guy driving um tons of just impressive impressive feats and tons of carnage you know (laughs) 
yeah, it was it was a it was a very very good mixture, and the Hellbent guys did a heck of a job putting it on. So, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, usually, you can hear echoes of broken axles yeah. coming away from yeah. an event like that. Yeah, I don't even know how many broken axles were at that event. It was it was substantial, no question about it. And I, I did a uh, I, I shot it quite a bit with my with my Canon. I got some stills, uh, some pretty decent stills. You know, I had a I had a um, ND filter, which is essentially like sunglasses for your camera, and I had it on there the whole time instead of jumping back and forth between open lens and that ND. I just took everything with that ND filter on in. So I was there predominantly to shoot video, and we got so much cool stuff. Yeah. It's just, I mean, I got 40 gigs worth of stuff to, to, to funnel through. It's It was a it was a heck of a show. So that's, not, that's a multi-day event, right? No, it was, it was all it's done a single on Saturday. Day event? Yeah, it was done okay. on Saturday, so. And so is that a single run event or do you get elimination? Or? So, they, so they have four different courses, aggregate score, and then there's like this bonus feature. Uh, they called it, uh, I, can't, I can't remember, it was like Bounty Hill or Bounty Hole or something like that. And it, mm-hmm. was, it was this feature that was, I want to say it was somewhere between about, I'm just guessing here, maybe about 12 to 16 feet of an obstacle. Mm-hmm. And you look at the line, you're like... No easy, way. Easy enough, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I mean, you look at the line, and, and uh, uh, the only person to make it up was uh, the event promoter. His name was Steven. He, he went up in his four-seater, you know, and obviously that length is what the helped. Length definitely yeah, helps. You know, I, mean, I think Steven's got like 35-inch tires on that thing. But, uh, yeah, he got up it, and w- nobody was expected in any of these two-seaters to make it up there, and, and an RC did. It, it was pretty – it was shocking, to be honest with you. Yeah. Like, I, I was looking at this, uh, this obstacle going um, – you know, coming from Enduro, I'm like, hey, I think there's a line on there. I could get it up on a dirt bike. And then I'm watching the attack angles that the, all the other guys were going right. at. I'm like, nobody's making it up this. <laughs> you know, and when that X3 made it, he just slammed into the face and the car jumped up. jumped and rebounded into a spot where he could grab just a little traction. It was kind of high centering the main rock that was a big, big trouble spot. And he got up it and the place went nuts. Like, yeah, yeah cause I don't think anybody expected And it wasn't his first try up. though. I mean, he hit it a few times. He No, it, everybody got one shot at it and then threw in the towel because they'd rolled and didn't want to damage their car any right. further. But, uh, you know, he was on there burning out for a little while and then uh, finally just hit. Yeah, that's hit what I'm saying. Yeah, he, he, yeah. Was, he, he was there about two to three for, minutes. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. The, the thing about rock crawling, or I should, I should say rock competition, is it's more of a sacrificial event than it is a yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> look, look good doing it yeah. type of event. Yeah, and everybody, everybody got through a lot of the obstacles. There was some uh, DNF uh, out on the course, but you had machines out there. I want to say, uh, say third place was... Maybe like a 09 or a 11 RZR, if I remember right. Maybe like an 800 or 900. Yeah, a smaller one. Yeah, and uh, RS1 won it, you know. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of by that. By points? Came, uh, one by points, yeah. A lot of that uh, came down to driver ability but, uh, and setup, but I was very impressed. Um, a lot of RZRs and kind of a mixture between 64 and 72 inch, you know, I, I, I almost thought that the narrower cars had a little bit of an advantage. Yeah. I was going to say yeah. getting through, getting traction a lot of times is about squeezing yourself into something right. instead of going over it. And right. so I would imagine that, uh, they probably planned for a lot of wide cars mm-hmm. and probably designed the course around that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, rock calling is a, is a, is a crazy sport that if you've never been to an, any competition, that it's definitely worth at least doing it once. Yeah. Yeah. At least checking it out. You know, the, uh, the weather was, li- the weather was pretty decent. The sun was out, but it was super windy. Uh, so my drone footage didn't come out as cool as I'd hoped, but, but, but nonetheless, uh, we should have a very, very nice clip to put together about the nice. event. Cool. Some, uh, upcoming events. Uh, we have Camp Razor this weekend, October 25th and 26th. That's always a highlight for a lot of guys yeah. every year. Yeah, um, we unfortunately will not be there, but uh, one of my coworkers, uh, Ben, is actually going to be uh, walking the event, checking it out, and just... I mean, I almost think that that, from as it pertains to my industry, that that event probably has as much value as SEMA. It's just unbelievable yeah. the amount of end users that you can touch base with at that at that event. So. I'm not sure there's a higher density of people event at that do right. than that event. So, right. Um, and the nice thing about um, that event as a attendee mm-hmm. is the sheer number of things they give away at that event. Yeah. There is a never ending stream of raffles and giveaways at that event including full-sized razors like they give multiples of them away not just one they usually give away like four five six eight ten yeah. whatever it is yeah. that year yeah i think that's the event i think i think you're right about uh in terms of people congregating around a particular obstacle like it probably as it pertains to side by sides there isn't a time where there's more people on glamis you know i've seen some footage of uh, uh 
back probably 10 to 15 years ago where quads were king. Right. And it looked like Woodstock. Yep. There were so many people out there at, the, I think it was around Thanksgiving, but uh, yeah, it, it is cool to see this come together for the industry and yeah, I'm looking forward to checking it out next year. Yeah. Polaris has definitely taken a leadership role in Glamis area and the events out there and, and Camp Razor is obviously being named after the Razor focused very much so on Polaris. And I would like to see more uh, brands, more vendors come to the to the table with events like this. Um, it only enhances the user experience. It only enhances their brand. And they're all reciprocated. I mean, people want these events. They Absolutely. want to allocate vacation time to come do this. I mean, yep. you're, you're seeing that with UTV Takeover. I mean, UTV Takeover is like Woodstock. <laughs> really, there's so many people out on the coast, you know? Yeah, I, I just think that it, it's... Competition's always good, right? Um, but I would like to see some of these other brands just enhance their game by stepping up to the table and saying, we're going to also be yeah. top of mind, yeah. right? And um, it seems like a lot of the can guys, a lot of the Honda guys, all those other brands seem neglected and, and in a way that it's not that they're going to leave the brand, but in a way that they're, they, could, they could be a, so much more, there's more potential for investment in the brand if they would just step up to the plate right. and, and provide those experiences. Right. Yeah, it, it's interesting to see what Yamaha is doing because Yamaha will sponsor these big events on the East Coast. Like they've got events out at Brimstone. And I think it's strategic based on the fact that the, the YXE isn't the go-to car for trail riding, right. especially on the East Coast. They think it's, you know, it's more of a high performance machine. So it's, it's interesting that Yamaha is going after those events and not, not really, I mean, they're not, neglecting the West Coast events. They show up to a lot of these right. events, but they're not putting on big events. And it's right. probably because they understand that in the West, they have a little bit more support. Right. So, yeah. So, uh, Camp Razor this October, and then we have Halloween come up, coming up. And the reason I bring that up is just to, to remind people to stay safe, to, to be visible. And, um, it seems like every year I, I hear of a friend or a friend of a friend that, that their kid got ran over or, you know, something like that because somebody was being, um, not being vigilant, uh, right. vigilant around the corners or whatever. So watch for those kids. Be safe. Um, uh, we got SEMA coming up early November, uh, the 5th through the 8th. I'll be there Monday through Saturday. Yep. Come say hi. It's no longer just a Honda and Toyota event. It's a everybody event, including side-by-sides. Yeah, off-road's kind of taking that over. I know I mentioned that on our first show. It, uh, we're in the off-road booth, or I'm sorry, the off-road wing. wing and yeah. Uh, yeah, When your event has wings of industry, you oh, know the, it's a big event. I don't think, I, I think the, the building that we're in, I think it's over a quarter mile long. Wow. It's huge, yeah. Um, and so then we also have the International Off-Road and UTV Expo uh, in early December. So this time of year, things are starting to thin out as far as density yeah. on the calendar, right? Yeah. Uh, but early December, uh, the International Off-Road and UTV Expo. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, that's out. Uh, I'm, I can't remember the name of the place, but it is in Scottsdale. It's uh, it's like, man, I want to say it's like a, almost like an ag facility, right. massive facility. Um, it's put on by Rugged Radio. It's an amazing event. Um, you know. You've got a lot of different products and features and stuff to look at. And I did hear, I, I know I mentioned this in the first episode as well too, but uh, they actually added an Overland uh, component as well. So okay. yeah, it, it sounds like it's going to be International Off-Road UTV Expo in conjunction with almost like a miniature Overland Rally. Yeah, so so these types of expos are a nice opportunity for you to get out and see, touch, and feel the different options for different components of your vehicle, right? Uh, you go to these these events and they have, um, you know, the seat manufacturer will have all their different types of seat frames there, so you can sit in them and, and know if it's the right one for you or not. Um, you can you can put harnesses on. You can try comm systems out. You can do uh, just about anything for any accessory at these expos. And if you're not going to these events, you should start going to these events because the manufacturers provide astronomical discounts at these events. <laughs> you know, they really reward people that want to come up and rub elbows. Yeah, usually so. there's some sort of uh, of some some sort of carrot that, that you can expect from most vendors there. And whether that be closeout specials, whether that be show specials on new product, or even just the fact that you're able to see the new product before it comes out or, yeah. or whatever. So yeah. the first international off-road expo I went to, they had a customized Wildcat 2X that had a turbo on it. And that was six months before the car was released. 
Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was orange. I want to say it was in the rugged radio, but don't quote me on six months. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that, that just came out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I want to say it was literally before the car was even released. I mean, everybody'd seen pictures of it. Right. You know, it, was coming, it wasn't but, a secret. Right. It wasn't a secret. So. Yeah. So um, the other part of that uh, is just supporting the industry, right? Like this is an industry that we want to be a part of individually. Uh, but also as a community. And, and the way we support that is by supporting the brands, supporting the vendors, uh, showing up at shows and showing our support for them. So yeah. um, it's not always about what you can get the cheapest. It's about being a part of the community and, and showing up. So I like to show things off. <laughs> we got a little package in the mail. Actually, let me clarify. Uncle Ben got a package in the mail and he said it was my option to show this off on the podcast. So that's what we're doing. So this little blue bag came from Custom Splice. So what this is, if you can see it on the camera here, is a, looks like almost a ball bearing, but there's no bearing in it at all. And what this is, is about a two inch round uh, billet aluminum diamond recovery ring. And what this is, is you put your, shop, your soft shackle through it and tie it into whatever mounting point you're gonna put it into. And then you put your um, recovery rope or your, um, your, uh, heart, your uh, winch rope around it through the shackle, and that becomes almost like a, um, why am I forgetting this? I am the worst with names of things. I have that problem too, but I'm also 10 years older than you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this, this kind of replaces a snatch block where it would be two, three pieces where it would have your two sides that you, you hook into with a, with a physical hard hook and have a pin going through some sort of pulley. It looks convenient, too, because, like, the snatch block that I have at home is about this big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, they're fairly awkward yeah. to store in your yeah. vehicle. Usually in, um, in your bag, it, it's at the bottom right. and, or cutting holes through the side of the fabric or whatever. So what this is is a replacement for the snatch block uh, in conjunction with a soft shackle. Um, now, that being said, uh, what you're doing is you're putting a moving metal part on a... Um, soft shackle component right so there's the potential for that over time it may wear through any protective coating on your soft shackle but typically speaking soft shackle recovery operations are typically less than 10 minutes so and you're not pulling the whole time on um, and you're not moving the whole time so right. um i would say that these are a cool little accessory for anyone that has a recovery kit on their vehicle and needs that that extra doubling up power that that doing multi point recovery does. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna check it out. We're gonna try it on a few different um, situations and see how it does. But my um, assumption is that this is gonna be a pretty handy little tool. Heck yeah, Uncle Ben. And uh, these are on sale on their website for forty bucks right now. Um, they are billet aluminum and anodized to the color that you select. So um, they do have different sizes so they have so this is technically a five inch but the inner diameter is smaller um and they have a 10 and 20 ton um uh, i'm sorry it's not a five inch it's a five ton rated ring and they have a 10 and 24 ton rated ring as well so if you're doing any kind of bigger vehicles if you do have a fully equipped overland and you need that that uh, option you you have it and we've got them in yxz red yxz blue <laughs> uh rc uh rr orange yep heck yep. yeah so they, 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 like I said, they come in blue, orange, and red. And uh, there was a raw option at the very beginning, but they took that off. Yeah. So anyways, unique, different. That's what we like um, around here. So um, yeah, uh, to wrap the episode up, just want to remind everybody to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, where you can watch us, our beautiful bearded faces on online. Uh, or you could subscribe to the podcast on any podcast platform. We're on uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. We're on Stitcher. We're on Spotify. We're at all the places. And uh, uh, we would really appreciate the follow and the like and the comments below. So please uh, give us feedback. Um, we would like to start doing user questions and, and answers on the show. So at the end of the show, we may be throwing an answer or a question or two of community submitted questions that we can maybe speak to and, and show a solution for. Yeah, I've been inundated with a bunch of battery questions, which that stuff can get really boring. So I'll be kind of selective about that. But uh, <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. No, it's, we, it's great we, to get we definitely will have a, uh, 
a, a power and stator type episode yeah. at some point where we talk yeah. about power distribution and, and connectivity. So I also got a, I got a message a uh, year in review. I think that that would be great towards the end of 2019. We kind of yeah. talk about, uh, cause I would love to talk about some of the events that we've been to over the last year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that'd kinda, be a great time. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, next episode, I think we're going to probably jump on the top 10, um, things for Christmas. Yeah. Christmas is quickly coming right. up. Uh, and if you have any, an off-roader in your family, or if you are the off-roader and you're looking for things to maybe drop hints on, yeah. uh, coming up with maybe some lists of stocking stuffers and under the tree boxes that w- we would like to see under our tree. Right. So, um, yeah, we're super excited to keep bringing this podcast to you. Uh, subscribe, like, share, and uh, comment. Let us know what, uh, how you feel about the podcast, what you think, and, and what we can do better. So, Appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Come see me at SEMA. (laughs) (laughs) Peace.